All right, everybody, welcome to <laughs> welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. Here today we have Dr. Robin Hansen with us. He is an associate professor of economics at George Mason University and a research associate at the Future of Humanity Institute of Oxford University. And he's also the author of books like The Age of M, and the elephant in the brain, which will be the central theme of our conversation today. So, Dr. Hansen, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. Great to be here, and I'm wondering what you dissent about. <laughs> yeah, we will get there. <laughs> okay. I guess. So, <laughs> and I mean, the, th the central themes of your book uh, kind of give me a lot of material to to pick on people and to make them angry you know so well, that that's also another reason why <laughs> i wanted to talk to you today okay so let's see in the title of the book is the elephant in the brain hidden motives in everyday life so when you talk about hidden motives you're you're sort of talking of things that go on in our minds at a subconscious level right uh, well, I mean, uh, yes, it, it includes that. Uh, that is, we're, we're just talk. We're comparing what people are actually doing to the most public descriptions they would give of it. So, uh, say for about going to school, you look at what a graduation ceremony would say or a letter of application, and in that context, you will talk very idealistically about learning the material. And then if we look at the details of your behavior, we'd say well, that'll make the most sense if we think of it as trying to show off. And then we're ambiguous, or that is, we're not committed to a position on how conscious you are of that. Uh, we, we have 10 areas in our book where we go over and show that in each of these 10 areas, we seem to have hidden motives. And uh, different people will be uh, differently aware of their motives in these different areas. So for some people, they will say the usual thing, but they know they're lying. <laughs> and for other people, they will think they are sincere. Um, and that varies from person to person and context to context in complicated ways. And it's not really a simple binary distinction. People really have a lot of intermediate positions where they kind of know, but they kind of don't mm -hmm. uh, in a complicated way. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But don't you think that um, one of perhaps the main reasons why people don't really have direct access to all these sub subconscious stuff that go around in our minds is because uh, if we were to have access to them, then it would be very metabolically expensive for us to know, oh, I'm doing this because of that, and our brain has to uh, create all these operations uh, with the inputs it receives, and then mm. uh, as automatically as it can to produce an output. And then, sure. I, I mean, from, a, from an evolutionary perspective, it, it wouldn't really make sense for us to be aware of the of all the reasons why we do the the actions we do right well it certainly doesn't make sense to be aware of everything <laughs> that's too much <laughs> uh, and, and it's relatively quick for people to figure out what they're supposed to say that is people relatively quickly in life figure out the thing everybody says on the surface about something mm -hmm. uh, but then with time and attention you will notice a lot of details and then you will naturally figure some things out and uh, you know, at near the end of life, a great many people are really quite aware of a lot of the ordinary hypocrisies. Uh, <laughs> but they've also learned to shut up, <laughs> to, to not be too... For most of these things, people aren't interviewing you on them all the time. So it's not like you actually have to go to a lot of work to hide it. it it's not something that comes up. Uh, but if you are a specialist in the type of subject and you and you are relatively public, well, then it might be more important for you to uh, hide because, uh, on the other hand, you might be especially good at hiding. So that that's some of the things that vary from person to person, how important the subject is to you, how much anybody would be asking you about it that you would need to hide, uh, how good you are at hiding, and, and how, how much you really need to understand what's going on. So often people who are, say, salespeople or managers, uh, they have a huge payoff to really knowing what other people are doing and why. And for them, it's well worth the effort to consciously understand what's going on, even if they know they shouldn't say so in public. Yes, exactly. But I mean, I already had this conversation or sort of this conversation with Dr. Lida Cosmides last month. 
And I mean, she was saying to me that uh, when people have knowledge coming from disciplines like evolutionary psychology and even other disciplines from psychology, she, she told me that people have more representative awareness or something like that. I mean, that people are more aware of the hidden motives that regulate their behavior and they then have more of sort of an opportunity to make a decision on not behaving according to uh, negative motivations, let's say. But then I told her that perhaps she was a bit too optimistic about it because, for example, uh, I'm the dissenter because I'm on the 35th percentile in terms of agreeableness. And so when I get to know that we have these negative motivations uh, that motivate our behavior and to behave badly with other people, then I pick up on them and use it as excuses for <laughs> my behavior. So, you know, so there, there's also that side right. of things. So, th I mean, there's an enormous amount of detail from uh, different people, different contexts, different professions, different stages yeah. of life, with different roles. Um, our book is really, you know, at the very beginning level of saying the basics. <laughs> So yeah. we expect there's a lot of sophistication that people could learn if they continue to pursue the, the line. Uh, you know, many of the things that we say in our book, a lot of people know. So uh, we talk about politics, we talk about education, we talk about medicine. People who have specialized in those areas for a lifetime, they already mostly know what we have to say. <laughs> uh, but uh, they usually don't know about all the other areas. So uh, we're trying to connect, put this all together and say, look, it's not just that your area is weird and different like you thought. All through our lives, uh, we have these standard stories about why we do things, and we're wrong about them consistently in lots and lots of areas. And that's the new thing we're trying to say, that there's this big wider perspective. So, uh, you know, people who study education, they privately know mostly that, yes, school isn't that much about learning the material in the sense that people don't actually learn that much. And uh, right. people don't actually care how much they will learn, but still, uh, the larger world hardly knows that. <laughs> Everybody else who studies something else, uh, the thing they hear about education, is that it's about learning the material, and then that seems obvious, and it's what everybody says, and it fits this, the surface structure of things, and they don't even realize that they should question it. <laughs> Same for, again, politics and medicine and religion and lots of other areas of life. Uh, you know, we usually just start out naively assuming that what people say on the surface must be right. And then it can take us a lifetime to realize that that's wrong in particular areas that we focus on, and we may never realize that it's wrong in lots of other areas. So our book is about trying to say all at once to everyone, even at a young age, look, we're wrong about lots of things all at once, and you should change your overall perspective, especially if you're a social scientist or a human scientist that is someone studying human behavior. Mm -hmm. Yes, and another very interesting point that you talk about in your book is the fact that uh, people usually behave or perform a behavior and only after the fact do they rationalize it. So, I mean, and there's uh, those experiments that were done by people right. like Michael Gazzaniga with the split brain uh, patients, right. So, right? so, in a sense, I mean, psychologists know the general idea and most people have heard the general idea. So we're, we're in this somewhat strange situation where almost everybody knows that in principle, people can just be wrong about what they're doing. Uh, but then they still don't connect that to the many ordinary claims we make about what we're doing. <laughs> so you might think you could trick somebody into you know, not being honest about their motives for many particular things, but then you just still assume that we do the usual things for the usual reasons we say because it doesn't really occur to you to think that that could be wrong. And so our book isn't revolutionary in psychology. So unfortunately, to some degree, our, our book's been classified as psychology. And so psychologists reviewed it for the publisher and they reviewed it for newspapers. And they say, well, well-written, interesting examples, but the basic thesis is, is nothing new. And, and they're right. Uh, but we think that the conclusion is radical for people who do social science and policy. And unfortunately, it's not classified as a book for them. And so they haven't felt like they should need to respond or engage it. But uh, people who study, again, education, politics, medicine, uh, you know, charity, those people should uh, realize the whole world is different than they thought. And it should be radical for them, uh, this 
conventional wisdom and psychology in the abstract. And of course, even most psychologists don't really realize <laughs> that this applies to these many specific areas of their lives where they've just been assuming they have one motive and it's really something else. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, an interesting thread that runs throughout the entire book, I think, is the fact that you associate these hidden motives a lot with selfishness. But uh, wouldn't you say that because we evolved in a highly complex social environment and so we have these highly complex social cognitive apparatus in our minds that uh, a lot of the things and the, mot and the motivations that we have lead us to pro-social behavior more uh, perhaps than we could otherwise be? Well, we are quite pro-social creatures <laughs> compared to most other creatures. And clearly that's mediated by a lot of complicated cognitive mechanisms. Uh, our hypothesis for the reason that we're not aware of our motives uh, is that we are avoiding norm enforcement. So uh, humans are different uh, from other animals and that we have social norms. And there is this basic puzzle, if we have these motives in our behavior, why don't we know? So all of the motives we say we really have are completely reasonable motives to have. They're, they're not terrible motives to admit to necessarily. But still, the idea here is that the main, you know, co a competitive environment, a difficult environment our ancestors faced was each other. And the main way we face difficulty from other people was via norm enforcement. So human has norms. We're watching out for whether other people are violating norms. We have the norm that if we see somebody violating a norm, we're supposed to say something about it and then do something about it. We're supposed to coordinate to punish and discourage them from continuing to violate the norm. And if we don't do that, we are violating a norm. And so we're all very concerned to uh, not be violating norms. <laughs> so we are always watching our own behavior, asking, uh, can I tell a story about how this is consistent with the norms? And then we're looking at our rivals, wondering, could I accuse them of violating a norm? And in a sense, our conscious mind is mainly that machine. Your conscious mind isn't like the king or president deciding what to do. It's the press secretary whose job it is to take a potentially hostile world and defend the actions, to explain them in a, in a reasonable way so that you are as innocent as possible from norm violations. So uh, n many norm violations are in terms of pro versus antisocial. So we're, we are really eager to make our actions seem immune from norm violation accusations to, to just give a very pro-social spin on them, even if, of course, what we're really doing is also somewhat pro-social. But many pro-social things can still violate norms. And so we are especially eager to give the most norm violation-free spin we can on our app behavior. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so, um, th but then again, there are certain types of norms that we you call in the book, and I don't know if other people call as well, weak norms, that it is more is uh, much more easily for people to violate them even in front of other people uh, in certain circumstances at least sure so um the the world of being accused of norm violations includes some really extreme strong norms like norms against murder <laughs> and excludes lots of relatively mild norms like norms to hold doors open for people or to stand in line or right to not sneeze at people uh and there's all these relatively mild norms and and for many of them, being a violation might, you know, mostly get you a, a raised eyebrow or something. But we're still concerned to avoid those norm violations because still, in the in the in a, the right context, someone could put them together and make us look bad, and and it could go wrong. Uh, so, you know, that's true. Even like writing blog posts or tweets on the internet, most of the time, things go fine. But you're always wondering, well, how could somebody spin this to make me look bad? And people are very sensitive to all those possibilities, even if they're usually not realized. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so, uh, so we have kind of uh, negative motivations and positive motivations according also to the social circumstances and the cultural norms we, we are in. But uh, when, when people do something based on positive motivations, uh, they don't really hide it, right? They can even put uh, them forward as reasons why they did something. Well, uh, 
medicine is probably the chapter that will most surprise people in our book. And uh, in there we say that uh, the usual story about medicine is that we use doctors to get well. And we say what really goes on in medicine is you're using medicine to show that you care about other people and let them show they care about you. Now, as usually described, that sounds pretty positive. Uh, but it's still a motive we're hiding. Uh, it's still less positive than the one we'd rather pretend to have. Uh, we, we'd rather uh, say, well, I'm going to the doctor to get well, and, and my friends push me to go, and they care about me, and they want me to get well, and so I, I'm going to go, and, and if my friends get sick, I'm going to push them to go and help them to go because I want them to get well. And you know, the real story is more that I kind of know it doesn't work, but I still got to go through the motions of pushing other people to do it so that everybody thinks I care and, and um, <laughs> I need to, to uh, push other people to do it so that uh, everybody will think I care about them. And that's less positive, but it's still pretty positive. But again, uh, we are looking for the most positive <laughs> spin. And so even though pushing people to go to the doctor and going to the doctor to you know show you care about other people and to let them show about you, they care about you is you know, compared to most things we might do, it's still a pretty positive, nice thing to be doing for people. It's just not nice enough. Uh, and, it, and it can be accused of some sort of hypocrisy because there, there is that level of doing something while knowing at some level it's not quite, not quite what you're saying. And we'd rather just avoid the accusation of that. Mm -hmm. You know, so for example, if you, uh, uh, you know, if you said... Um, somebody invited you to an event and you said, I'm so sorry, I have something else that day, otherwise I'd love to come. And it turns out you were lying, you uh, didn't really have something else that day, uh, you, you just you know, didn't want to do it, you liked them, but you were just trying to let them off nicely. Now, at one level, letting them off nicely is a kind thing to do, certainly much nicer than saying, you idiot, why would you think I'd ever want to go to one of your events? <laughs> <laughs> On the other end, it's not quite as nice as pretending that you just couldn't go because you had some other conflict. <laughs> and so if, if someone were to expose and show that you had lied about the fact that you couldn't go, that would still make you look a little bad. And so you're trying to avoid that. So you, you try to make sure they don't know that you, <laughs> your other end. So if, you, if you're actually going to do something else, you think, well, could, they, could somebody that might get back to them see me at this other thing? Because <laughs> you're worried. <laughs> <laughs> now that you said you you couldn't go because I don't know you you were had to you know clean wash your hair that day, <laughs> that instead you're going to be somewhere else and someone might see you, and now they might report back that uh, they saw you at this thing and uh, they the person would think but you said you were washing your hair, uh, and so again uh, you know it's not like you were being especially mean or or antisocial per se you just weren't as maximally pro social as you could possibly be. And still, that's something you'd be trying to hide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I mean, how, how do you integrate variability in terms of personality? Because I mean, evolutionary psychology also predicts a certain degree of variability of in course. terms of, of personality traits right. uh, occurring among people. And I mean, there are certainly people that sure. because that because they are too agreeable. Uh, their hidden motivations are positive and are pro-social and, and because they are too nice to other people, it can even be harmful to Absolutely. themselves. Right. So, so the first thing to realize is, um, say, the excuse that the dog ate my homework only works because sometimes dogs eat homework. <laughs> the, the dragon ate my homework doesn't work because yeah. <laughs> there are no dragons and everybody knows that. So... Uh, almost everything that people do, there are hundreds if not thousands of possible relevant motives. And the world is complicated. Each situation is a bit different. So, of course, averaging over a big area like medicine or school or, or religion or charity, uh, averaging over millions of people and you know thousands of situations, of course, and lots and lots of motives ended up being relevant. So we, we can't be talking about the only motive, the one motive to rule them all that, that's only in... in uh, presence there. What we're really saying is what's the most common motive? And there's the th motive people say and that mo that excuse of the motive usually people say works because sometimes it's true. It wouldn't work as an excuse if it weren't sometimes true. Sometimes it is a big, you know, at least a big and sometimes even the biggest motive that's relevant. That's why it works as an excuse. Uh, but it's 
to say it's, it's an excuse is to say that we overplay how much that motive matters. We exaggerate it. Uh, it's not true as much as we like to say. Uh, that's what we're saying by saying there are hidden motives. There's the motive we say, and then there's the most common motive there is. But of course, averaging over people and situations, there are thousands of relevant motives. And you know, our first purpose was just to guess the most common motive. Now, of course, you know, our more refined analysis could tell you the most common motive for certain kinds of people in certain situations, perhaps indicated by the personality type, age, gender, profession, you know, culture. All of, I'm sure eventually you could get a much more refined estimate of the most common motives by situation. But uh, our first gut is just what is the most common? And, and right there, we're surprised to be able to say something new, <laughs> something that would surprise most people. Because you would have think at least that most common thing would already be pretty well known. So if people say the most common motive for going to school to learn the material, you would think, well, that's obvious. And that the, the subtlety is to figure out whether George on Tuesday in chemistry class <laughs> had a particular motive or not. Um, that would be complicated, but knowing that the typical ones would be easy, but apparently we're wrong even about the typical ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and we already talked a little bit about how the fact that we evolved in an environment which was very, uh, which was highly complex in social terms, um, th uh, th this same environment um, if if on the one hand it can lead us to prosocial behavior on the other on the other hand it can also endow us with motivations that are not really that positive so for example one good example i think is conspicuous consumption sure although uh even then you could say like the usual complaint about showing off is that you don't actually have the characteristic you're trying to show so say for virtue signaling or brag, you know, or bragging about how smart you are or bragging about how loyal you are. Often when people complain about such bragging or showing off, the, the main complaint is that you're just wrong. You aren't as smart as you pretend or you aren't as, as you know, et cetera, as you pretend. And so a good news, at least, is that on average, typically signaling correctly shows what you actually have. When people show how smart they are, they are smart. And when they show how caring they are, they are caring. Uh, and how strong they are, they are strong. And how loyal, they are loyal. So I mean, from that point of view, it's not so negative. That is, we, we have some positive characteristics and we show them to people and they are convinced that we have these positive characteristics. So again, it's not such a terrible thing. It's, it's even pro-social, if you like, uh, to show people you're loyal to them and you care about them and you have resources that you can use to help them. But nevertheless, it's not the most positive thing you could show. And so we actually hide it and we uh, show other things because they violate norms. So foragers have long had this norm against bragging. So even though you could argue that bragging is a relatively positive thing, that is you're showing features that other people admire and you're correctly showing that you have them, still you're bragging and you're not supposed to brag. And so you're trying to avoid the accusation that you're bragging. So you indirectly brag in many ways, but you would deny it if anybody pointed to any particular thing and you generally have enough excuses that they can't prove that you have violated the norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that's a very interesting view because uh, I mean, uh, even when people perform conspicuous consum consumption and they are not really aware <laughs> in full at least of what they're doing, I mean, for example, uh, s uh, now and then people are a bit too moralistic about uh, when people show off, for example, and when it's related to material stuff, that they right. are being a bit superficial. But but on the other hand, and if you look deeper at the issue, I mean, for someone to be showing off material wealth, uh, th there's uh, there's the possibility that the way that uh, that person went through to acquire that material wealth right. also shows other personality traits that are positive, right? Absolutely. For example, cons conscientiousness. Absolutely. So, I mean, you might criticize their lack of charity, <laughs> uh, but, you know, they, they might show you they have charity. So they might conspicuously show you the wealth via charity, or they might also have a lot of charity. And of course, when they show you the wealth, they are showing you that they somehow had the capacity to, to produce this wealth or to acquire this wealth. And even though 
There are some ways to acquire wealth that are not terribly impressive or admirable. Many ways are. And of course, what they're also showing you is that they care about your opinion. They want you to like them. And that values you. If they're showing off to you, specifically, they are saying, I want you to like me, and I'm going out of my way to try to show you things that you might like about me so that you'll like me. And that's still a pretty pro-social thing. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, also this thing about the prestige status. I mean, in human societies and even, in, uh, in, even in other primate societies like chimpanzees, it's not really true that... Uh, the alpha male, let's say, let's give that example, uh, acquires his position through oppressive means. I, I mean, even, right. in and even in chimp societies, they have to move along the social realm and try to gather a social and stable a, so, a stable social network to be able to stay in power. A and that also requires positive traits like uh, empathy, right? Right. Um, I mean, all very reassuring, but of course, the actual fact is that any one person is still afraid of admitting that they don't have the most positive possible pro-social motive and that they might be violating a norm. So again, uh, seeking leadership and power too aggressively or eagerly is, is a norm violation, even if the way to acquire power is to help people and to the way to acquire leadership is to be useful to the group. Still, it's a norm violation to too eagerly seek power. And so again, we are, of course, this is a sense in which we are less pro-social. <laughs> that is, we care more about not looking bad than we do about whether or not it's actually such a bad thing to seem. Uh, we, we, there's a norm against bragging, there's a norm against seeking power, and um, we are afraid of seeming to violate those norms, and we are focused on making sure our appearance is consistent with the story we tell that we haven't violated those norms, uh, even if they are not such terrible norms to violate. So, you know, of course, many of these norms are ancient, and you could reasonably question whether we should still keep them. A lot of human norms uh, go way, way back, and they may not be so useful today. But uh, again, if you're in a society with a norm, um, you, you're scared to challenge the norm and tell everybody we should stop following the stupid norm. You mostly uh, want to show everybody you're following the norm. Mm -hmm. And even the thing about bragging, I mean, we could look at it in the different light. So, for example, I mean, if someone uh, has an, an important position, let's say some sort of leader, a political leader or something like that, um, I mean, it's very difficult to be in a situation all the time, constantly, where uh, a huge group of people is focused on you. Uh, and I mean, it's really <laughs> stressful and emotionally and psychologically yeah. and so on. It's draining, I mean, certainly. And I mean, if you brag now and then, and if by bragging you acquire a little more uh, of, well, of, there's, there's, of self esteem, <laughs> then. We can, we can make an even stronger argument, which is to say that the norm against bragging means that we show off in inefficient ways. So uh, let's think about dating. Uh, three main things you might try to show off in dating is how smart and how healthy and how rich you are. And in order to show these things off indirectly so that you can't be accused of bragging, you may spend a lot of time like reading a lot of prestigious books and, and things and learning a lot of vocabulary and sprinkling your conversation with big concepts and words and references to prestigious thing, you know, things that you'd have to spend a lot of time reading as a way to show off how smart you are. And, and to show how rich you are, you might buy expensive cars and clothes and just pretend you're doing them for other reasons. To show how healthy you are, you may uh, drink a lot and show that you don't fall over very fast, or you may get into sports and, and, and spend a lot of time running hard or f competing. And all of these ways to show off indirectly are expensive. Now, today we actually have much cheaper ways to show these things off. You could show somebody an IQ test or a bank statement or a doctor's test. And <laughs> if, if you could just show people those things, you wouldn't have to waste so much effort in all the indirect signaling, which is really quite costly. But because we have this norm against the direct signaling, we're kind of stuck having to do all these expensive indirect signals, uh, which again, it's not that we don't show off. It's just we have to do it in a way that's deniable so it's not like people aren't showing off. We're not achieving the world where people don't show off. We're achieving the world where they show off in an indirect way such they always have an excuse to pretend they aren't. That's the world we're living in. So you might argue, 
being able to just more directly show off again with a bank statement or an IQ test or a, or a doctor's, te- you know, a physical fitness test, uh, that would be a better world. It would be cheaper, more f- efficient. We'd, we'd be showing off the same things we already do anyway, except that we'd be showing them off even more precisely and accurately. Uh, and so why wouldn't that be a better world, you could argue? Yes, but on the other hand, uh, isn't the the fact that people have to perform more costly signaling, let's say, also important for other people to be able to better evaluate their commitment? So, for example, if you went to a woman and proposed to her uh, uh, directly, oh, here, here, you, here you have an extract of my bank account, <laughs> so I won't well, say anything <laughs> else. You know. Well, so, so in addition to showing general features, you, you want to show devotion to particular people. Yeah. Uh, but just having expensive clothes or an expensive car or having a large vocabulary or even you know being good at soccer, none of those show attention to a particular person. There's yeah. still generic signals to everybody undifferentiated. So uh, you, you, of course, do often want to show particular people loyalty and attention, and you want to signal that. And, of course, you can't do that through general things, but, but the things we've been comparing before are all equally general. The bank statement and the expensive car are equally <laughs> signals to everybody undifferentiated. Uh, you know, a, a, a more way to show a particular person that you say are rich is to give them an expensive gift that not everybody sees. You give them privately, and now you've shown them you're rich and you've shown them that you are focused on showing them that it's them you want to impress and that's of course a different message Mm -hmm. yeah right Uh, and now uh, about self-deception because we have this interesting cognitive mechanism that uh, at the same time allows us to better lie let's say (laughs) because it allows us to uh, obscure at least a little bit our hidden motivations from our conscious awareness, right? But on the other end, there's also deeper psychological mechanisms going on, going around in our heads uh, that allow, uh, I don't know exactly at what level, perhaps a subconscious, unconscious level, to keep track of what's going around in reality, uh, right? Of course, you know, yes, we use self-deception to, uh, to to present a good image, and it comes m- somewhat at the cost of, of being able to make accurate assessments. <laughs> uh, and uh, that often surprises people because they think the importance of making accurate assessments would be so overwhelming that surely you wouldn't uh, give that up for some mild showing off benefit. And that's in the state of mind where showing off is this mild thing, and, and it hardly matters, and that's just wrong. <laughs> um, you know, cer- certainly for our ancestors and for us, uh, our social environment is by far the biggest one that matters. We're, we're far less likely to get bit by a snake or fall off a cliff. The, mo- the most of the things that will go right or wrong for us is because other people will come to like us or dislike us and treat us well or badly. That's the main thing that matters, and that's the main thing for our distant ancestors. So, um, you know, the social impression you make is in our world and has been for at least, you know, a million years, <laughs> the main environment that mattered. And so... Uh, it makes a lot of sense for your mind to distort uh, its processes in order to create good impressions, if it possibly can do that. Yeah, and it is related to the interpreter module, right? So uh, there are people at least that propose that our minds, uh, in the cognitive sense, uh, are endowed with a specific module that works in order for um, to, to put a good image of yes, ourselves of to other people out there, right? Right, and people tend to... The thing is, when people like talk to each other, they are very aware of what's in their conscious awareness, and they are not very aware of all the subconscious things, but they think of the conscious awareness as the thing in charge, <laughs> yeah. like the king on the throne. And so they think that's the center of action where the spotlight is and, and where every all the main stuff that matters. Uh, but in fact, that's the press conference room. <laughs> <laughs> that's where the PR person is, is giving their spin. Um, it's not where the main decisions are being made. There's a whole bunch of other rooms, <laughs> bigger and more elaborate and, and with people better informed, who are making the main decisions. So uh, you just have to notice that quite often you make decisions and you don't really know why. 
And of course, if asked to give an explanation, you, you come up with a plausible story, but you have to realize how uncertain you are <laughs> that that's actually the correct story, which should give you a clue that you weren't, <laughs> the you that is there as the conscious mind wasn't really uh, included in that process. Mm -hmm. And therefore, may not really know what's going on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And wouldn't you say that perhaps some social or moral norms work at the collective level uh, like rationalization? So I don't know, perhaps uh, things that come from religion would be a good example. Well, um, moral norms, um, of course, in some sense, norms are morals. <laughs> morals are norms. They're, they're the same thing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's the things we call morals are, are norms uh, sort of about resolving conflicts. And so different societies can have different morals, but the important thing for us is to pay attention to the morals in our society. And, and a function that the morals have to have is that a society has to be able to agree on its morals. And so that's a major constraint on morals. That is, uh, you know, we often, philosophers and others often do a, an analysis of what the best action to do would be, the most helpful one, and then you see that the moral action is not quite the same thing, and that's often easy to understand in terms of, well, morality has to be observable, monitorable. So the more, um, the harder it is to observe what people are doing, the more they will have to go out of their way to keep their actions simple and, and, and have them fit very simple moral norms so that they can uh, be shown to be following the norms. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, and a very particular aspect, a uh, very particular social aspect, the, the role that laughter plays in society. So the, uh, it plays many different roles, right? Could you give us some examples of, of them? Well, so uh, laughter comes from play. Yeah. So uh, many animals have a play mode. So you can think of, of you know, young bears or something fighting, uh, play fighting or play chasing. And in play mode, uh, they're trying to practice the real thing minus the harm. <laughs> so they might play chase and they might play flight, but they will not pull up, put out their claws <laughs> and they will not actually want to hurt each other so that they can practice. And so the, the norm of play is there's some scope of play that is unless, you know, if we're not chasing something or somebody's chasing us and then it's okay, then within a certain space and time that we're playing. And, and the mood of play is, is light and friendly uh, because none of us really expect to get hurt in play. And uh, then um, we have to be wary about whether we've left play. And so we, we need to be constantly monitoring that everybody is still in play because if, if you think you're playing and they think they're really fighting, it's not going to go well for you. <laughs> because they'll really have their claws out and you won't. <laughs> so you, you need to make sure that we all think we're still playing to keep playing. And of course, in a rough and tumble play, somebody may well get hurt. <laughs> and the moment they get hurt, they will say, ouch, and now we're out of play mode. <laughs> uh, we, we suddenly pay attention to the real consequences of what's going on. Or all of a sudden, uh, you know, there's a... a, a predator nearby that we have to watch out for or a snake or something say and all of a sudden we we give a warning and now we're out of play mode uh, we, we are dealing with something serious um so a key thing about play is we have to have these ways we show we're still playing or not and so animals and humans have a lot of ways to show that we're still playing so so when we're play fighting and, and play chasing we have a certain stylized kind of motion to to show that it's it's not the real motion uh, and a stylized kind of voice and, and attitudes and and one of the things we do is we smile and laugh um, so we don't just continuously smile and laugh though um, we laugh especially more when we fear someone might think that we're not playing anymore that is when we seem to be moving toward a border or there's a warning that there's something that might be misinterpreted uh, as we're not playing anymore that's when we especially laugh to say, no, we're still playing. It's okay. So laughter is, is a reassurance that, yes, we're still playing. And so uh, if, if you say, if you were playing and, uh, and, and you were rolling and then you rule off a cliff, but it was a two-foot cliff, <laughs> and you fall to the bottom of the two-foot cliff, now you laugh. Uh, because the, just before you were falling off the cliff, you said, oh, my goodness, <laughs> I'm falling off a cliff. Uh, this might not be play mode anymore, and then you hit the bottom of a two-foot cliff, and you go, ha, 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 wasn't that funny, because uh, I thought I might be leaving play mode, but I'm not. I'm, it's, it, we're still playing. So th that's general for animals. Now, for humans, uh, laughter, again, is a key we're still playing signal, 
But humans are very social in our play. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, one of the things we play with is norms. So uh, because we don't all actually know uh, which norms apply where, when, how, one of the things we learn is norms in play. Well, that means in play, we pretend to violate norms. Or we pretend to get up the edge of violating norms. And we pretend to punish people for violating norms. We play at norm violation. And so this means we are often uh, doing things in play that would seem like norm violations if they weren't in play. Uh, which is why, you know, famously, comedians can be more honest about many things than the rest of us can. Because in the play mode of a comedian, they're allowed to pretend to violate norms that the rest of us can't. So comedians are often saying things that look racist or sexist or, or violent, uh, hostile. Uh, you know, they might like say how they really just hate that their wife does a certain thing or their husband does a certain thing and they, they wish they would die or something like that. All things that we would be terrified to say in ordinary non-play mode. But in play mode, you can say those things. And so an example we give in our book is that, you know, people often laugh at the joke uh, that if you're in prison in the shower, don't drop the soap because you might get raped. Ha ha ha. <laughs> and of course, you might think, well, what's so funny about prison rape exactly? Uh, but of course, the funny thing is, uh, we know we're not in prison and we're not going to get raped and nobody we care about is. And so it's funny for us. It's literally funny. And so, in fact, uh, a lot of laughter is going right up to the edge of and past the edge of norm violation to to appear to what would do appear to violate norms in a non-play mode, but actually do it. But of course, like insulting people or saying mean things about them are norm violations. And so, if in play mode we insult each other, well, we actually do insult each other, <laughs> but it's not a real insult because it's in play mode. And so, you can get away with insulting people. <laughs> In play mode, in ways you can't get away with them insulting them in the real world. So there's a sense in which you, you can get away with real norm violations by calling them play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, with laughter, you can convey an honest piece of information to another person. But because um, it's, it's not really good for society at large that uh, to know that you think that specific thought about that person you laugh you laugh laugh off after the fact and then you say oh i was just kidding or <laughs> something and so like that. so i've actually noticed that uh, this is one of the big ways that people are fighting politically today especially in the united states where we're having a you know a peak of political polarization <laughs> which is yeah. that you know when say people on the right like roseanne barr makes a joke uh, you know, people say, you said that was a joke, but we're not going to treat that as a joke. That That's not a joke. And we're going to cancel your TV show and kill your career because that's not an acceptable joke. Yeah. And so they deny the ability to, to, to laugh about those things. But for example, in uh, Austin, Texas, I went to this, uh, um, you know, comedy show, which was a very left oriented comedy show. And, and they were really quite comfortable, like insulting basically all their political opponents in rude and crude ways. Uh, but because they're on the left, that's okay. <laughs> and that's, in a sense, how they show their social power. That they can uh, do what would ordinarily be a norm violation and call it a joke and get away with it. And their political opponents can't. And that's how the rest of us see who's in charge and who's winning the power fight. Uh, because the ones who are allowed to joke about things, and of course, that's often added as an extra thing. So, you know, uh, on the left, people have often complained that people on the right were not just couldn't take a joke and, and they just didn't have enough levity and, and you know those religious people and those conservatives are always so serious and so you know so so grumpy and so you know yes yeah. pompous etc and it's always the accusation that, that they can't take a joke but of course part of what's going on is they're not allowed to joke if, if they joke uh, that's the end for them because they don't have the social power to joke uh, whereas other people are allowed to joke because there's often the things, well, we know they're on the right side, so we know they really couldn't have had a mean intention. So surely it was just it was just a joke. Whereas the presumption on those people on that side, we just know they're mean. And if we ever see them saying something that sounds mean, we, we've proven it. And they can't, we're not going to let them have the excuse that it was just a joke, because we know they're mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do, do you think that humor or comedy should have or has any limits? Because, I mean, th there's... Uh, great discussion, as you said, occurring nowadays about 
people getting offended by things a certain comedian says and I mean uh, and I, I guess I understand that now and then when something uh, when someone makes a joke about something that is really that really impacts the audience personally or someone who went through a situation which is involved in that joke uh, I, I think it's pretty understandable that people get upset about it but sh should comedy have certain socially imposed limits or, or not? Well, um, I mean, you know, the first observation is uh, when you have rules and then you have discretion, then you often have a biased enforcement. So I'd say we certainly have a, a, a non-neutral enforcement of these uh, kind of principle that you shouldn't joke and, and, and make people feel unhappy and, and uh, be about something they're sensitive about. Uh, it's only really applied on one side. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, you know, it, I would think, you, you know, it would be better to either, you know, allow everybody to insult everybody and call it a joke or not allow anybody to insult anybody and call it a joke. Uh, either of those two are better than, you know, only saying some people are allowed to do that and other people aren't. Um, it's, it's worth noting that, uh, you know, the ancient world was pretty anti-joke. Uh, mm -hmm. Consistently, intellectuals and, and, you know, people through history have not approved of joking. It, it was, it was, you know, joking was not much of an excuse for anything. So, you know, in the last few centuries, we've changed our attitude about joking. And again, we've made this ideal. So often we say, you know, those ancients, those were fuddy-duddies and they were too serious and they, they couldn't enjoy life and laugh. And we've made laughing and, 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 and uh, humor like this ideal. We, we've put it on this pedestal as one of the highest ideals. And people often say, you know, why do you like them? Why do you want to marry this guy? And, and often the highest praise they can give is he makes me laugh. Because that's become a sacred thing, really. It's one of the most sacred experiences we have in a modern sort of secular society is laughter is a sacred experience. It's like worship or, or in the presence, being in the presence of God, really. And so uh, because of that, uh, you know, it's very hard to say people shouldn't laugh uh, because they raise it at such a high bar. But then, but then at the same time, they say there are certain topics that are so important that nobody should ever laugh about that. And so, again, that's a political power, which topics you're allowed to and which particular offenses you're allowed to label that with, what you're allowed to laugh at and what you're not. And so, yes, yes, and as you say, it can become pretty easily bipartisan because, I mean, uh, coming from the work that people like Jonathan Hyde did recently uh, about the righteous mind and how um, people on uh, are fall on the left or the right according to the moral foundations they value the most and even uh, thanks to their personality i mean it's it's very difficult to convey a joke that people laugh about in one side to the other side without it being considered offensive also because of those very deep right. biological aspects right well it's also worth noting that that humor tends to be very culturally dependent so you know it's even often hard for people to watch a movie from 50 years ago and, and appreciate the humor <laughs> so even within the same culture across time uh it's the the humor doesn't pass and of course comedies are also not things that go across international borders very well so international blockbuster movies tend not to be comedy or, or if they are they're just very simple physical comedy like mr bean i think was an international hit because everybody could just see the physical humor but as soon as you get to more abstract social humor it, it just doesn't translate and so that should make you wary of thinking that you are being universal with your laughter. Uh, often, your la often laughter again is, is this very inbred thing. So um, I mean, this is a key point. Uh, you know, there are a lot of norms that are relatively consistent across human cultures and time, like norms against murder. And then there's a lot more, uh, a lot of other context-dependent norms, like slight variation, what it's okay to say, what it's okay to do, etc. I mean, as you know, people used to like eat with their hands and, and burp out loud and, you know, those things were all fine <laughs> and now they aren't. And so a lot of the humor, because it's about showing you where the edge cases of, of the norms are, are about a lot of this context dependence. They're very sensitive to particular times and places and subcultures and what their norms are. And so that's why it doesn't translate very well is if you're going to focus on showing the edge cases of the norms in a particular time and place for a subgroup, well, that's not going to be the edge cases for some other people because the edge isn't going to be at the same place. And so it's not going to be funny for them. 
it's going to seem either to be a fine thing to do, not at all a violation, or obviously a violation. They're not going to be right at the edge of being a violation. Uh, and so again, for play, uh, when you're playing with norms, you're going to pretend to violate a norm, uh, but not really violate the intent of the norm, say. And so we can all say, well, that shouldn't really count as a violation, <laughs> at least within a certain group. Uh, but of course, from outsiders, they're not be able to, tent to tell that subtlety. They might think that looks like a violation to me. Or they might think, well, why do you even care? Um, you know, so, you know, like a norm about burping at dinner uh, to somebody who, like, since it's okay to burp at dinner, they would go, well, what's what's so funny? So he burped, <laughs> right? But, of course, in a world where everybody's very sensitive about burping at dinner, uh, the fact that somebody seemed to have burped, so, you know, there's often humor where somebody made a noise and something else made the noise, but everybody looked at you and thought, you must have farted. <laughs> <laughs> right and that that's been a piece of humor in a lot of things because you're not supposed to fart but the, the humor was he didn't really fart it's something else made him look like he fart ha 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 right but of course that's makes sense in a world where that's at the edge of the norm violation and in other worlds it's not funny mm -hmm. yeah and uh, another thing that many people or most people even tend to look down on but every one of us Uh, does it is gossip <laughs> and I mean uh, sure mo mostly mostly intellectual people uh, they really they really tend to look down <laughs> on people when they're gossiping and they say oh no we don't right? really we're, we don't really take information sure. from gossiping but the fact is that this our social world is so so complex that we really have to have access um, to information that come from other people about a third person because we can't really keep track of other people's behavior 24 7 and those are really important uh, informational cues let's say for us to to make decisions regarding right. other people right right so i mean there's a lot of these things we do that are functional but we still have these norms against it i mean Burping and farting are, are examples, obviously. I mean, burping and <laughs> farting have a very basic, obvious functional uses. Yeah. <laughs> but you're 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 supposed to like do them a little out of sight. Yeah. Uh, and not put them in people's faces. And similarly, with say uh, gossip, I mean, everybody knows that most everybody does gossip, but there's <laughs> still this norm that you're not supposed to put it front and center. You're supposed to kind of pretend you're not doing it. You're you're not supposed to allude to it as much or call attention to it. Uh, because it's supposed to be a little disreputable. So, uh, but it's a, it's a mild thing, but it's still a, um, it's still a mild norm violation, and so all else equal, you'd like to pretend you were doing it. Um, a similar thing might be swear words, a curse words. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, they have clear functional value, uh, but they are still norm violations in many contexts. So, I mean, the you know interesting thing to notice is that, you know, centuries ago, Uh, the elites would show they were elites by being fragile. They would have fragile clothes, they would have fragile skin, they'd have fragile habits, and they'd have fragile emotions. <laughs> and, uh, lang you know, the, the norm against lang cursing is, is, is about that fragile emotions. Uh, so elite people would be shocked, shocked. And that was part of showing they were elites, that they could manage to be fragile. So, you know... A, a lower class person, they more often wanted to show they were tough. So their skin might be tough and their, they might have calluses and they might have, you know, uh, sunburn, and, you know, they, and they might have strong skin and be ready to fight. And they show that they are tough and ready to be tough when it's needed. And the elite would show that they didn't have that experience. They don't have calluses and their skin isn't tanned and uh, their clothes are fragile and they would they had to run in them, they would, they would fall over and collapse because their clothes couldn't be run in, right? And so over time, we have come to disapprove of some of that elite fragility. We, uh, you know, so now today, we, we expect clothes to be functional. We expect that you should be able to move in clothes and, and even run if you needed to, mostly. And uh, we don't, you know, we still give people with lighter skin more higher status, but we, we don't like ourselves for it. <laughs> You know, a few people will uh, say out loud that they like someone better because they have lighter skin, <laughs> although, <laughs> although they do. Uh, but, yeah. but that's what I say out loud. But for 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 the fragility of emotions for language, uh, they are really quite proud of it. Still, people are quite proud to have maintained the emotional fragility 
that a swear word would really just make them faint <laughs> or just shock 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 them right yeah. uh, where you know which is a kind of elite fragility that people still embrace um, whereas they haven't embraced many other kinds of elite fragility um, and so uh, again but because there's a norm uh, you know a weak you know the elite norm at least and of course, there was a lower class norm, and in some sense, this is one of the major things that happens over time. As we've gotten richer, most everybody's been trying to adopt the elite, previously elite norms. It wasn't a lower class norm to be fragile. It was a lower class norm to be tough. Uh, that made perfect sense in their world. It, was, it only made sense to try to adopt this elite norm of being fragile when you were rich enough to be able to afford to be fragile. But as everybody tried to become elites, they've all tried to adopt at least that kind of language emotional fragility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, another thing that is related to gossip, at least I think, is the fact that people tend to favor uh, family members, friends, and people that sure. are close to them. But, but I mean, it's again the same issue, at least I think, because uh, yep. I, I mean, we are in a very complex social world, and even if people tend to look down on people that are more nepotistic, let's say, the fact is that uh, it is still at least somewhat rational to make decisions uh, th that regard people that we know much better than people that are completely sure. outside of our social network or realm, right? And so this is another example of what pro-social means, right? Yeah. So, right. So favoring your family clan is still pretty pro-social. Yeah. It's just not maximally pro-social. Yeah. So the the norm to to adopt neutral uh, norms with respect to your family is more pro-social, or seen as more pro-social than the norm to help your family. And so we are trying to hide often our being family favoring uh, because that's violating the norm against nepotism or favoring your family uh, even though of course favoring your family is still a pretty pro-social thing so selfish is not quite the right word for that I mean collectively at the level of your family it's selfish but you individually are not being selfish you're helping your family yeah yeah exactly uh, and okay so now moving to another topic that the end this one I found really interesting, at least in one of its aspects that you cover up in the book, because I haven't, I don't recall having read about it, about this aspect of it before. That is advertising and the fact that uh, marketeers and advertisers and other people like that, uh, they also tend to target not uh, exactly their primary buyers, but other people through their social connections, right? right. Is, is it how, is this right. how so it works? You can th think of it as, as the extension of language. So mm -hmm. um, in, in small s societies, they have small languages, and so they have fewer words for color and fewer words for different kind of love, say. And in some sense, they can only perceive fewer kinds of color and feel fewer kinds of love because having a feeling and having a name for it lets you be much more aware that that's the feeling you have. And so in our more modern society with larger vocabularies, there's a sense in which we can feel more things because we have a name for each feeling and we can, um, you know, if you feel wistful, and you know what wistful means, you can say, I feel wistful, and you can say it, you can notice that you're feeling it. And if you didn't have that word, it would be harder to know in a sense that that's what you're feeling. Now, um, we like to show ourselves off to other people and advertising expands the language of showing off. <laughs> and so this is the, the key idea. Uh, so we give the example uh, in there of uh, a beer ad, a Corona beer, which the, the, the standard advertising strategy of, of this beer company is just to show you uh, the beer on the beach, people on the beach with the beer. Now, there's no obvious connection between this beer and the beach. <laughs> you, it's not made on the beach. It's not especially good to drink on the beach. It's just a beer shown on the beach. But this advertising expands the language of things you can show off. So now if you hold up this beer and drink it, you get to say, I like beach. And you don't have to say out loud, I like beaches, which would sound kind of awkward. 
uh, out of context. And so advertising allows a, a wider range of associations to be made with products and services. And then you can go about your life using products and services and indirectly saying things about yourself without bragging, without even directly saying them, but uh, having some confidence that other people will know what you're saying. And of course, this is why advertisements have to be mass advertising. So many people have, you know, noticed that in the past there was mass advertising and they attributed that to, of course, technology like TV was limited or magazines limited to masses. And now that we have the ability to target ads to particular people, then we won't have mass advertising anymore. We'll just be telling each person what they want. But a big function of mass advertising has been to show everybody a concept so that it can then be used to uh, for any one person to show off. So, uh, for example, Rolex at, uh, watches are expensive watches that pretty much only the rich buy, but they're advertised to everybody. You might think in, in a world now of specialized, they could make sure they only put the ads in things that expensive people would see, and they wouldn't need to advertise Rolex watches to everybody else. But the point is, somebody who buys a Rolex wants to be envied by everybody who sees them. And if other people don't know that Rolex is the watch of the rich, uh, that doesn't work. So Rolex people need everybody to see the ads about Rolex to know that even though you can't have a Rolex, if you see me with one, you should envy me because you'll know I'm rich. And so, again, you can say all these things indirectly uh, through uh, the products and services and things you have uh, in a language that other people can then um, use to uh, attribute things to you. So if you say, I went to Vegas for my vacation, people, Vegas, has, Las Vegas has a certain kind of association of the kind of place it is and the kind of people people go there and the kind of things they want to do. And now you've got to advertise that you're the kind of person who likes to go to Vegas. And you don't have to say anything more about that. Uh, it's just an indirect thing you say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another thing that occurs is that uh, advertisers also work with the you see, the sense you have of your own group identity, right? So, for example, even people who are against uh, capitalism and the market, even they can be targets of the market. So, for, for example, you can be an anarchist and still have an anarchist T-shirt to signal of course. to your buddies, right? Right. So, uh, I mean, that is a surprising lack of awareness in some sense, but there are people <laughs> who, uh, in words, will give you the sophisticated critique of capitalism, and they maybe even say some of the things we said, that, that people are just buying these things to show off, and then they will make sure to show you that they have a uh, artisanal beer and, uh, you know, a special f fruit uh, grow grown locally, and, you know, they will they will show you many things about themselves through their products. They will think of them as anti-capitalist products because they were made by small businesses or small sellers. Uh, but of course, it's still capitalism. It's just a smaller seller, right? They, they might be ashamed of somebody who would buy something from Disney, for example, but it's okay to buy from Ben & Jerry's or something because uh, they have this idea that well, nobody's shown me that Ben & Jerry's is such a bad guy, but it's not obvious they aren't. It's just you haven't heard anything again but in some sense it doesn't fundamentally matter what they really are what most matters to people is just what images they have and uh that's again not something people want to admit mm -hmm. yeah and another aspect that you also talk about in your book that is one of the 10 areas you cover i think is uh, art because art also involves a lot of conspicuous consumption and it, it is also related to courtship displays and right. things like that, right? So, uh, certainly in our society, but um, you know, going a long way back, the standard story about art uh, is that it produces an experience. So uh, you, 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 sit in, you stand in front of the painting and it, and it does something to you, or you listen to the music and it does something to you. So this is the key idea that you are buying these experiences. Uh, and um, that isn't as true as you'd like to think. Uh, so we, as we talk about in the book, you care about a lot of things that don't uh, influence the experience itself. You care about how many artists made something and how unique the thing is and what materials it's made out of and how difficult it was. 
And when you learn that something's easier than you thought or more people put into it than you thought, uh, you're less impressed and then you like the art less, even if it's exactly the same experience. Um, now, which kinds of experiences people like to admire that they've had has changed over history and which kinds of things people like an artist has changed over history. Uh, but that the basic thing of, of wa wanting to be impressed by the artist and wanting to have an affiliation with the artist and wanting to show your discernment of which kind of things you can distinguish, uh, that's been relatively constant. But many centuries ago, artists weren't trying to be different. Uh, they were trying to be, you know, the same perfect, unique artists, the same, you know, produce the same kind of painting, the same kind of architecture, the same kind of music. And what they aspired to was to be good enough to be the best at doing the standard thing. And that's what people wanted to affiliate with. And so art could be very stable in ancient societies. And fashions were very stable. People wore the same clothes for, you know, centuries, and had the same kind of architecture houses for centuries, and the same kind of paintings and sculptures for centuries. And in our modern world, uh, we put a lot higher premium on variety. Uh, and so uh, we want to have a unique experience, and we might like to admire a unique artist with unique abilities. And that's an interesting fact about the difference between the modern world and the ancient world, but the idea that what, you know, what you're really doing is wanting to admire the artist. As an artist, you want to be admired, and you want to, you know, make a connection with them, and in particular to show your discernment that you were able to distinguish the better from the not so good, uh, and that's that's been consistent uh, for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the consumption of art also has this wasteful aspect to it, like for example. Uh, it is also related to, uh, this is one of the main examples, people who study art from an evolutionary perspective, like Geoffrey Miller and people like that, they, they associate it, uh, uh, the main example they give is the peacock's tail. So, for example, it is a way of conveying information to the females and, in our case, to other people in the social realm uh, that we have so many resources that we can even waste them in showing off the, this right. thing or these aspects without really, without really losing anything. Right, so that's somewhat striking. So when we think about the ordinary conspicuous consumption, like having a, a fast car or a yacht, right, or a Park Avenue apartment, I mean, most people disapprove of that waste because they think, well, you know, what a waste that you're just spending on it just to show that you have the money. But when we get to art, people really do emotionally like the wasteful art. Uh, that is, you know, some people use their artistic abilities to make nice looking couches uh, or interior decoration of apartments. They, they, they make pretty, you know, funk but functional uh, cars or boats. That is, many, even most artists in the world are designers who take the real things we use and try to make them nicer through their artistic ability. And those are not the most prestigious artists. In fact, they are called sellouts or, or <laughs> and they are denigrated by other artists and the public as not being real artists. A real artist wastes. A real artist wouldn't be making something useful, more pretty, more, more useful, more nice, more smooth, more elegant, um, easier to use. A real artist would be making something completely useless. <laughs> that they made in a very impressive way. Um, you know, so it even comes in writing, right? So if you think of people write um, manuals, people write, uh, you know, instructions, people <laughs> uh, write menus, and that writing is not at all respected. Uh, people who write novels or people who write abstract books like ours, that's much more highbrow exactly because it doesn't look very useful. And so... To, to be able to write such, to have the time to write such a thing and to uh, have the time to read such a thing and to admire it, that all shows all those people of how they are uh, more admirable people. And the people who, say, write instruction books or people who read instruction books, you know, books about how to repair your car, <laughs> how, how to plant a garden, that's considered lowbrow. And uh, those aren't good writers, you see. A good writer wouldn't do that. E even in fiction, of course, people show they have the free time to, say, read science fiction or murder mystery, and that's not the highbrow literature, you know, because you can read that for fun and, and you don't mind it so much. It's the difficult literature that you find it hard to read through. Most people would find it hard to push themselves through and keep reading. Uh, that's, the high, that's the high literature that shows that it must really be good because uh, you don't like it. 
most people don't like it. And some people can say they kind of do like it. They're the impressive people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we already touched touch a little bit on this today earlier. But uh, going back to charity, it's also a domain where um, even if it is, uh, uh, even if we don't know about it, it's very wasteful in the sense that uh, people are convinced by a lot of different charities to give donations that right. then that then are not really used in an efficient way and well of course for, for, unfortunately you, nowadays we have the effective altruism movement that tries to uh, in a scientific way convey the information to people who want to donate to charity the um, charities that are the most efficient because i mean people can even be led to to go to a certain place and to serve soup to the poor and to the homeless, and that still isn't the most efficient way for them to help other of course. people. Of course, I mean, we see this distinction in a lot of different areas, which is um, there's this ideal of uh, charity is to help, and the people who are doing and giving to charity are helping more than other people. <laughs> yeah. uh, they just aren't helping as much as they could. And so, uh, but if other people really can't tell the difference, um, maybe they don't care. So most people can't tell which charities are all helpful. They just might know that you gave to charity and they might know it's a charity they've heard of and they might then give you credit for being helpful. And that's my, all you might really care about is the credit for being helpful because uh, you, you would, if, if your people you're trying to impress would know which things were more helpful, then they might say, well, you gave what? <laughs> you know, so... Um, so, so for example, if you, um, you know, you gave to charity and your charity was the Putin re-election fund, <laughs> <laughs> most people might go, well, how is that charity exactly? And you might say of how you think he's a great guy and how that would be helpful. But other people might go, I'm not really going to give you credit for helping people for doing that exactly. Or you might say, you know, there's the uh, speedboat uh, judging fund. A speedboat competition judging fund and you, you were donating to the speedboat competition judging fund and people might go speedboat competition judging really <laughs> uh and you know so the more obvious it was that something wasn't really very helpful then the less credit you would get for giving to it but as long as on the surface it looks like it's helping somebody and you, you can't really tell it's not then it's the united way or whatever it is then you go okay fine they're a nice person they gave the united way and so I mean, this is, of course, about the difference between, you know, people who can see more precisely and carefully versus not. I'd say a similar thing happens with academics, intellectuals. So if you devote your life to being an intellectual, to writing about an interesting, difficult subject, many people will give you credit not just for being smart, for being charitable in a sense. They will say, well, you're trying to help the world. You're, you're studying, say, the Holocaust or you're studying uh, refugees or something, right? And if the topic you're studying seems like it's related to something important and, 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 and grand, they might give you credit for being a good person, for trying to help. And of course, we intellectuals know which of these various studies has much of a chance of being useful and which not. And we often go, well, what's the point of studying that? That, that has almost no chance of being useful. And people go, yeah, but, you know, I got to study something and it's, it's you know, not negative value. Maybe something will come out of it. And they don't seem to really care much if it's more effective at helping the world. Uh, they just want to study something. And then they kind of know that the public can't really tell the difference. The public doesn't know which things people study might be useful or not. They say, well, you're a professor at something. Well, gee, that's pretty impressive. And gee, that's a nice thing to do. You know, Supposedly, professors give up the higher salary they could earn in industry because they want to be a professor and contribute to the world by adding more knowledge. And people give them credit for that without really knowing much about which things are more effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, charity also has other aspects to it that is, for example, proximity and relatability because, I, I mean, <laughs> the same people that uh, might condemn someone for not giving to charity to help uh, black children in Africa, uh, those same people, uh, after the fact, may be happier if the person that they condemn um, give more resources to to them and to their relatives. I, I, I mean, and, and there can be this sort of incongruence right. run, running around here, right? 
Right, so so we, we argue that the people you're trying to impress with charity mostly don't want you to be the most effective with charity in some yeah. absolute global sense. What they really want is you're associating with them and uh, they want to think that should they be in need and you would see them in need, you would feel some compulsion to do something. Uh, that you are the sort of person who when you see someone in need nearby, you do something to help. That's reassuring to other people around you to know that if they were in need, you would help. Your inclination to help the person who most needs help in the world or in history, not so reassuring to them because they're not likely to be that person. And so you're mo you're, in order to show off to these other people, you're mostly trying to just show that you have this general emotional capacity that when things get pass in front of your eyes or ears, <laughs> that show somebody in need a, a wailing cry of help or blood on the arm or whatever it is, well, they would just have to do something. And you, you show that capacity when people ask you for charity and help around you uh, in your world, but, you know, it's mostly you respond to other people asking you for help. You don't so much take the initiative and you don't go out of your way to study what would be the most helpful. You're more reactive in helping the people around you who ask for help when they seem to be around you, the people and other issues close enough to you in your world that uh, it affects the people around you. And that reassures the people around you that you care about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as we were talking about the effective altruism movement, for example, has on its basis uh, an utilitarian uh, ethics, right? So, uh, and utilitarian ethics is not really intuitive to people. Well, apparently, um, people act on utilitarian ethics more often, but the more visible an action gets and the more they have to rationalize it, the more they become deontological or, or based on you know, simple rules, which, which makes sense because uh, okay. when people are trying to monitor other people for their behavior, they, they really can't, they can't check whether you're being utilitarian. That's too complicated. They can check whether you're following simple rules. And so the, the more that people are going to watch out your behavior and maybe criticize you, the more you're trying to make sure you can show you followed simple rules because that's the thing they'll be checking for. Uh, it's, it's the closer you get to people, the more they know about you, the more you might try, try to actually be helpful because they might actually see if you're trying to be helpful. Because, you know, if you have a close friend, say, and, and, and you say, you know, well, I have this rule, you know, I, I help people go to an emergency, but not if they just want to go something else. <laughs> and you say, you know, I really want to go to this thing. Could you help me? And you say, nope, my rule says I only help people in emergencies. They might kind of notice, you're not really trying to help me. You've just got this rule you're following. Uh, people closer to you could tell the difference between that, and you want to show them that you actually care about them. And so you're going to do the more utilitarian thing, i.e. help them more on things they care more about if it's cheap for you. <laughs> Whereas for people far away from you who, who can't look at all that detail, you're just going to want to make sure nobody would tell a story that, like, somebody needed an emergency help and you refused to help. <laughs> Uh, that would be the kind of story that could get out there, and you want to make sure that story never gets out there. And so you're going to follow the rule that if somebody's in emergency and needs help, well, you help them then, but if it's not an emergency, you won't help. Mm -hmm. And that would just be a simple rule you'd follow to make sure that uh, bad stories about you don't spread far and wide. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and now to move on to um, education. So would you say that the biggest value uh, w when you when we compute, let's say, all the things, all the values that we obtain from education would be not really what we learn in an absolute sense, but the fact that with a higher education diploma, let's say, we can sign all to other people the fact that we are conscientious, the persistent, ambitious, intelligence, di diligence, and uh, diligent it's, and things like that. Yeah, it, it's pretty obvious at the highest levels of education that that's the main thing going on. Uh, I mean, there are other things going on too, but just mainly the thing that isn't going on that much is the thing people mostly talk about. <laughs> you know, the way school is organized, you know, there's classes and each class has a syllabus and there's reading material and there's quizzes and there's tests. Uh, and so the obvious thing it seems to be about from the structure of school is is to learn the material there. You know, if you, if you show up in the school, but you don't take any classes or you don't take the test, you, you don't get out of school. 
uh, which you, you could in principle get out of school if you never met anybody else or you know never did anything else but just show up for the classes and took the test or something but in fact um, you know it's showing that you can do those things is is the key thing so um, I mean, you know there are many ways people are able to show that they know things without school it's potential to just learn it at your own speed and your own way and take a test and show people but people aren't very interested in that they don't and they aren't very impressed by it uh, and of course in school people often you can meet people you can socialize you can learn sort of habits of, of the culture of the people who go to school um, you know meet your potential mates those are all important things about going to school and again a lot of people kind of know this in private but when we most officially talk about school, we forget it. And most education researchers study how to learn the material better, more, and faster. Uh, and so, and they have come up with many ways that we could learn the material more and better, faster. And we've mostly ignored them. <laughs> and this is true of lots of these other areas. We, we, look, we figure out better ways to be more effective in charity, more effective in politics, in medicine. And people mostly aren't very interested in the ways we've learned how to be more effective at giving the things we say we want. Uh, plausibly because we kind of know that we don't really want those things we are doing we have other agendas and that would be most you know especially vivid there in school we have lots of ways to learn material you know more faster and we don't adopt them and we aren't interested even though we say school is about learning the material yeah exactly and uh, i mean i already had dr david sigiri on the show and i talked with him a little bit about this because uh Another important aspect that education and school has is the fact that uh, in the modern world we have to learn to acquire a lot of different skills that are very distanced from our innate cognitive proclivities. For example, um, right. math mathematics, physics, I mean it's very, very abstract in comparison to what we had to learn in more traditional societies. Right, let's but say. most of those abstract things are not things we actually use on the job. We mostly use the abs most abstract things to show off. So we don't actually need to learn physics and, and uh, math, at least most of us. What most of us need to learn is the sort of things we can learn much more on the job, much more like our ancestors did. We're more using school, though, to show that we have this more flexible capability. So certainly, though, compared to our distant ancestor, we have to be a lot more flexible on the job. And we have to submit to a lot more dominance on the job. So, you know, centuries ago, you could submit to dominance while you were an apprentice, a young person, learn how to do it, and then keep doing it the same way for the rest of your life, and then never have to take an order. That was the usual way most people did their jobs through most of history. They, they had to take orders and be instructed when they were an apprentice learning how to do a thing, but then when they knew how to do it, they never had to change how they did it <laughs> through the rest of their life, and they never had to take orders from anybody how to do it. So, But today, our jobs change far more rapidly, and we have to take a lot of orders. We are organized much more complicated structures where other people need and do tell us that we're wrong, and we have to stop doing it the old way and must do it the new way. They tell us we're not as good as somebody else. We have to take orders from somebody else. And we have to, uh, you know, change how we do things. And so in that new world, the old habits of how you learned how to do things didn't work. And so school does help us acclimate to that new world. Because at school, you're constantly being told to new, do new things in new ways with ambiguous instructions and require, you know, get taking orders. And we extend that into adulthood. And now we've got adults, basically, you know, 22-year-olds uh, or, you know who are adults for certainly for all ancient purposes, uh, still in this mode of being told what to do, being given ambiguous instructions, being told that the way you did it last year is not good enough. Now I have to do it a different way. Um, and school helps in general with that attitude switch, although the specific things you're learning in school are not very useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I wanted to ask you, because you're in Portugal, I think that it, it was at the University of Lisbon, I'm not sure, but... Uh, the, uh, some professors created uh, a course on general studies, that is, people learn a little bit uh, of literature, a little bit of mathematics, and then they can choose the disciplines through, throughout the three, four year course. I, I'm not sure if it's three or four years. And they say that f at least for m m uh, most jobs, most occupations, uh, employers uh, show a lot more interest in people that go through that kind of education 
uh, instead of people that take highly specialized courses that then don't really grant them access uh, to a career that they would like to be on be, because with people that know how to write uh, that know uh, of basic statistics and so on uh, when they get there most of what they have to learn to perform the, their jobs they learn after they start working at the at the specific place well i i don't know what would you have to say about this well it's certainly true that people don't need to specialize in college say for most of the jobs they will take but mm -hmm. if the main point of school is to be impressive the question is how impressive are these general studies so i i'm, I'm afraid that at most colleges uh the less specialized plan of study is less impressive <laughs> <laughs> that is, it's just they, they don't require as much. And so because of that, uh, people have learned not to be impressed so much by those people. So I, the hard part would be to make a general plan of studies that's hard. That's so hard that most people fail. And that it's only the people who really stick with it and are really good that could succeed. Now, then the employers would be especially interested. All right. Now, there are things like that. So you might say being an entrepreneur is that. You have to do, basically, you, you can't specialize being an entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, you have to be able to do lots of different things. That's what it is to be an entrepreneur. In a big firm, people specialize, and you have to you do one thing, thing. In a tiny firm, you have to do everything. And so in some sense, showing that you were an entrepreneur is, is showing that you have that general studies. You, you were able to do a lot of things, but being an entrepreneur is hard. Yeah. It's not just taking some general classes at the low bar. Um, it's, you know, so often the general studies is you're taking like the intro classes of everything, and the intro classes aren't so hard. Uh, if you could make a general studies that was hard, well, and of course, one way people do general studies by being hard is to take double or triple majors. <laughs> if you can show that you can do the most advanced classes in three different subjects, well, that's pretty impressive. And that's kind of like being general, too. <laughs> so again, you have to focus, focus on what is the actual function is to show off. And so I think innovation in school has to focus on what's a way of showing off that people in the past haven't been able to do as well. How can, how can my school, my program, take a kind of impressiveness that people have potentially and that we could accentuate and show and shine that other schools haven't been able to distinguish? So, for example, just arguing verbally. Most school is written. So if people are just really good verbally, they just aren't able to show that off very well in most schools. Could you make a school that focused on the verbal, that focused on the ability to be quick on your feet in conversation and to engage and explain things and discuss things? I would say that's an opening for a school that, doesn't, that isn't there now and potentially a new school could fill that niche because it, you are showing a thing people have, you're showing off, and current schools don't show it off very well. If school is really about showing off, that's how you should think about organ educational innovation. Whereas people usually think, how could we help people learn more material better, faster? And if school isn't about learning the material, it's just the wrong way to think about school innovation. You should think about what's a feature of people that you could show off. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and there, there's a very interesting part in your book that is the part where you talk about how it would be to live in a society where people only did inconspicuous consumption <laughs> so could right. you talk a little bit about that and the problems well, it's it's, a, it's, it's kind of a thought experiment it's a little abstract uh, but right. the idea is just you know the stuff you have around you your cars your clothes your couches etc you know what if somehow in people's heads they just couldn't process the fact that you had a red couch or that you had a nice blue suit or you know, they just couldn't see your products and services. They, they couldn't perceive them or couldn't remember them, couldn't associate them with you. Somehow, through some strange, you know, defect, everybody just couldn't notice that. Well, how would you live your life differently? Uh, and the claim is pretty obviously pretty different. I mean, we already know things like, you know, you can look at the difference between underwear and outerwear. And it's quite a consistent difference. <laughs> underwear isn't seen very often. And outerwear is seen, and so underwear and outerwear are really quite different. They're made out of different materials, different colors, a different amount of variety, uh, etc. You could also think, 
well, what's the meals you eat that are the least observed? And what are the meals you eat that are the most observed? And how do they differ? So the, say the least observed meals might be breakfast at home. Mm -hmm. And those meals tend to be very simple and very regular and even boring, you might say. People tend to have just the same breakfast every day, <laughs> if they have one, because nobody sees and, and, you know. But when they go out to dinner in a group, well, those meals are quite different. Everybody's really concerned to have variety. If somebody at, next to you ordered something, you can't order the same thing. You have to order something different. <laughs> Right, and you can't order the same thing you ordered last time you were with them. You want to make sure you aren't aren't seen to be the boring person who always ordered the same thing. You have to order something different when you're at the same group of people. Uh, and you were trying to show discernment. You, you you can't just pick the top item on the menu. You have to look over the whole menu and really think to yourself, what would be the most sophisticated choice to make? And you don't do that at breakfast. You don't need a long menu at breakfast. <laughs> you could say, you know, toothpaste is kind of a it's a flavor. It's kind of like a food. Aren't you bored with always having the same toothpaste every morning? Shouldn't you have like at least a dozen different kinds of toothpaste flavors for every morning? You can have a new flavor for toothpaste because you don't want to get bored with your toothpaste flavor, do you? People don't mind being bored with their toothpaste flavor. <laughs> it's not a problem at all. They'll have exactly the same toothpaste flavor every day for a year. Why are they so tolerant of, you know, similar the, the sameness in toothpaste or breakfast and so intolerant at dinner with a group? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, okay, so now perhaps moving on to medicine. We already again talked a little bit about this before, but uh, there's this thing about the conspicuous effort that uh, health professionals <laughs> have to do <laughs> in order right. at least to try to reassure people that they're doing something visible to try to solve the issue there, even if what they're doing, they know that it will probably not do anything about it. So let's talk about medicine. And then after that, maybe we can jump up to a more abstract discussion of this entire area that yeah. we've been talking about, yeah. <laughs> as yeah, opposed to going through specific things. Yeah. Uh, yes. So in each of these areas, um, there's the supplier, the, the doctor who supplies medicine, the lawyer who supplies law, say the politician who supplies politics, and the supplier's motives is relatively easy to understand. <laughs> uh, when we talk about hidden motives, the suppliers don't so much have hidden motives. The politician wants to get reelected, the, the priest wants to have parishioners keep coming, and the doctor wants patients. And the doctor will do whatever it takes mostly to get patients. Um, so their motives is not puzzling. And so to understand what they're doing, we mostly need to ask about the customers. So we're looking at the customers in medicine and saying, well, what do they want here? And why are the suppliers doing the strange things they do for these customers? Um, we actually have medical textbooks from 4,000 years ago, from ancient Egypt. Uh, medical knowledge was enormously different back then. Uh, these medical textbooks are full of, of things to do, uh, you know, with different conditions a patient might have and what to do for it. And, and most of them are things we, we don't think work today. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, the textbook, the style of these things was very familiar. So, uh, you know, you would do some tests to check what kind of condition they were in uh, as an ancient Egyptian doctor. And then you would have a obscure, complicated treatment that used expensive materials and, and ex expert techniques. Um, and so, you know, some ordinary material was never good enough. It had to be some unusual, weird material. And of course, back then you had to say some weird words with it too, because that's what people expected would work. Uh, and it was remarkably like the doctors of today. <laughs> um, and so you can see back then it, it wasn't good enough to just go to somebody who just could tell you, like, rest <laughs> and, you know, take it easy and uh, drink more water, or maybe have some meat. Uh, they, they had to make up a weird paste out of weird materials that were hard to obtain, uh, that were expensive, and in a complicated way an ordinary person wouldn't understand or be able to do, and uh, that's what you were reassured by. And of course, it was expensive, but ancient Egyptians <laughs> were willing to pay to have and a doctor do these strange, expensive things. And it shows you that there's a demand for that. Um, 
there's a um, a section in War and Peace, which is you know one of my favorite novels, uh, <laughs> where um, Natasha, this uh, young girl, uh, she's lovesick, and uh, because she's lovesick, she won't eat anything, and she just lies about, and she seems to be getting sick, worse. She's just not well. Uh, she's lovesick, but uh, her parents, being rich, uh, must hire expensive doctors to come in, and these expensive doctors uh, all disagree with each other, of course, about what to do, and, and they're all expensive, and they each give rules about, you must do the following, like a paste every three hours, put on the, on the eardrum, or, you know, <laughs> uh, some complicated thing to do to follow. And, um, and, and the, the book says that her parents were comforted by the fact that they could do something for her. Uh, their, da- their beloved daughter was, seemed to be getting sick and, and getting worse, and they could show that they cared about her by hiring expensive doctors to come in and... And, and then, then, then they could just do things for, you know, they had to spend a lot of time. Uh, they, these things, rules about what to do, they had to be done every so, you know, at dawn at dusk or whatever, and they had to pay money for it, and they had to make sure she did it, and she would do it for them because they were insisting the doctor said you must do this, and they would do it. And, you know, the chemicals that the doctors were giving them were, were, weren't making her well, they were making her sicker, but nevertheless, she was a young, healthy person, and eventually got better. And, you know, it says that she was comforted by the fact that everybody fussed over her. <laughs> and that showed they cared about her. And they were comforted to be able to show they cared about her, to be able to do something for her, and not just have to sit around and, and be anxious. And so at some level, this is what medicine is, is for us. You might say, well, yes, people have always wanted to do this, but thank God today we have medicine that works, right? Well, yes, we do have medicine that works, but we also use a lot of medicine that doesn't work. And in fact, on the margin, uh, people who get more medicine are not healthier. So most of the me- extra medicine we do because we're rich and can do a lot doesn't help. And this is shown in ri- r- variations across regions and randomized experiments where some people were just given more medicine because they had cheaper prices. A lot of consistent data shows that people who get medicine are not actually health- healthier. But uh, they do feel cared for. So um, make the analogy to a Valentine's chocolate. So on Valentine's, uh, we have the tradition that uh, you have a, somebody you love and you give them chocolates to show that you love them. Now, when you give them a chocolate, how many chocolates do you give them? Do you ask yourself how hungry they are when you decide how many chocolates to give them? Well, no. <laughs> it's not about hunger and nutrition. It's about showing that you care a lot. So you buy as many as you need to to show that you care more than somebody who doesn't care as much about as you do. And you ask, well, what brand or type of chocolate should I get? And you'll realize that you have an incentive to give the kind of brand of chocolate that everybody thinks is good. And if you have a private signal about what you think is actually a great kind of chocolate, or they have a private signal, they will mostly ignore those signals for the purpose of deciding how generous you were. You're trying to be generous by giving the thing everybody thinks is good as, say, expensive or high quality, and they're trying to, they'll give you credit for having given those things. And so similarly in medicine, we're not actually paying much attention to what's effective. And even if we privately are given information about what's effective, we don't pay much attention to it. We are mainly wanting to get the kind of medicine that everybody gets so that we can show them we care about them. We can let everybody show they care about us. So in the Valentine's chocolate example, sometimes people don't have somebody to give them chocolates on Valentine's, but they might buy themselves some chocolate and leave a box on the desk at work. Why? Well, they'd like to be thought of as the sort of person people somebody cares about. It's reassuring to know that you're getting the same kind of care everybody gets, everybody who's cared for. So you're cared for too. Yeah, but aren't there also studies that indicate uh, that people who are who have a disease have a better prognosis if they are in a better mental condition? And so if they're getting support from other people and they are is somewhat reassured by their physician, their doctor, that they're getting a good treatment that could be a way by which they they can get real objective results. Even, of, even, if, of even if the even if the medicine, let's say, doesn't work. Right. <laughs> right, but you have to realize that the data say that on average, people who get more medicine are not healthier. So that average is an average of positive and negative effects. Mm. One of the positive effects is the one you mentioned, (laughs) that merely getting more medicine makes you feel loved and cared for and you relax and feel reassured. If that is helping, it's being countered by something else that's hurting. Mm. 
on average. Now, not in each case. I mean, these are averages over lots of treatments. We know of many particular medical treatments that seem really useful. Like if you get a gunshot, you should really go to a hospital and have them looking at it. I'm really quite confident, uh, you know, if you get a gunshot. Um, and certainly, you know, the low birth weight baby, uh, there are a number of very specific uh, treatments where we seem to be pretty good at it. Uh, broken bone. Uh, you've got a bone sticking out of your leg. I do recommend you have somebody look at that. <laughs> uh, but the overall aggregate data that people who get medicine aren't any healthier says that there are other contrary effects going on, other ways where people who get more made medicine are hurt. So it's not just some things do nothing and other things help. I'm afraid there's a third category of things that hurt. So, so for example, many people acquire affections, infections in hospitals. They come out of the hospital with something they didn't go in with because they get it at the hospital because the hospitals aren't perfect. Some, there's other sick people there and you can get something, catch something from somebody else who's sick at a hospital. That's a way in which medical treatment makes you worse. And it, you know, in addition, doctors make mistakes. Nurses make mistakes. Um, and that hurts a lot of people. So the net effect apparently is you aren't any healthier if you get more medicine. And even if somebody else is paying for it, you lose a few days a year of free time just because you're going to the doctor and doing all these other things. Yeah. So, so you are really paying costs. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that is really interesting. So now let's talk then a little bit about the more general aspects of all these things. The, uh, I'm, cur I'm curious, uh, I'm a little bit curious here. Uh, have, you got, have you been getting a lot of reactions from people after you wrote and published the book along the lines of, oh, what you're saying are <laughs> just so stories? Uh, no, actually. Oh, <laughs> that no. is, I, I, I don't get very much skepticism about our claims. I mean, I, I get skepticism of the form, that's plausible, but you haven't shown it well enough. You know, uh, the, the, you haven't considered enough other possible evidence or other possible hypotheses. And so people who think, of course, as we have since... <laughs> We go over 10 areas with 10 chapters. Each area only gets one chapter. So clearly we can't give it as thorough a treatment as you might get a, in a book or a library of books. Uh, so we're just giving the highest level summary of the, the key evidence that would suggest that there's an issue here. Uh, but we mostly don't get much skepticism overall. So I like to ask people, you know, there's 10 areas. If I can convince you of seven of them, I've won because I've said, well, look, there's a lot of hidden motives. I don't need to convince you of all 10. And so usually you can convince most people, you know, certainly 80% of people that you've, there's that, there, you're right about at least seven of the areas. And people vary in what's sacred. So for some people, you know, medicine is just sacred or laughter is sacred and uh, they're just not going to listen. Uh, you know, they're they're going to demand a lot stronger evidence than, than you've presented before they're willing to convince of something. They, they will admit that in principle there could be more evidence, but this isn't enough. Um, I, th I think... What I have gotten more of, I mean, is mildly surprising, although I guess it shouldn't, is people who say, like, this is this is a downer, and this is stressful, and, like, I've been trying to think about how I could be more honest and not have these hidden motives, and it's just too hard. <laughs> and it is really hard. And so, and in fact, we aren't presenting this as a self-help book, and we aren't recommending that you try to eliminate all of these hidden motives. That's just beyond your or anyone's capacity. You can't even eliminate half of them, I'm afraid. That's yeah, the, yeah, beca yeah, because it, it's not really possible, right? It's just a question of being aware of them and trying to direct our actions toward more positive, productive things, perhaps. Sure, but, but many, even most of us, you know, have this norm of I'm in charge of myself and I'm not a hypocrite. <laughs> and if I ever see that I'm a hypocrite, I'm going to fix it, right? And that's a pretty common norm. Few people like to will embrace the concept of there being a hypocrite. I mean, there are people who will, but um, most people, a great many people, it's really important to them that they be honest with themselves, uh, even if not with others, <laughs> about why they do things. And so if I point out that they've been so far dishonest, well, this is stressful for them. They want to know, well, how can I do this? And the news that you can't is not <laughs> very reassuring. <laughs> uh, so this book is intended mainly for, say, social scientists and policy analysts 
to be helping you understand the world of humans and how your uh, how you should understand that world and how you should perhaps do policy reform to make that world better. We're not trying to tell individuals that they should overcome these things. In fact, you know, most plausibly, people are born with these hidden motives and this habit of not seeing them because that's in their personal interest. Uh, it, it's probably, in, typically, not a good idea to know about these things. You, you were built not to know, and you are worse off knowing uh, in a typical situation that evolution had anticipated. So the reason to do otherwise is if you know, evolution didn't see you, anticipate your world, and your world is a world where you really need to understand things better, or whether you are just a specialist in needing to understand something about motives. You might be a manager or a salesperson, where um, if you misunderstand motives, you will really, it'll really go badly. And so then, and those things, it's less about understanding your motives than about other people's motives. And so we are, and I've focused on other people's motives. I'll have to say, I personally don't lose much sleep. <laughs> over whether you know I'm honest with myself about my motives I'm mostly going to like look at the average motive and assume that's me if if most people are doing this to show off fine I'm doing it to show off you know etc now that's the hardest for me and the most sacred things to me right so me as an intellectual say writing papers writing books I think of myself as somebody who's trying to understand the world and trying to reveal the truth and tell people and if, and if my book and other people say well you're really just trying to show off and, and make people like you I'm gonna go okay I, I guess that makes sense but I'm not gonna like bring that into each moment of each particular thing I'm doing because that's beyond my capacity and um, doesn't necessarily help um, but if at some abstract level I make a claim that's in contradiction with the claim that most intellectuals, even myself, are mainly trying to show off, well, I will notice. I will. I want to notice that and and not accept that conclusion because that's not right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you just said, it, we can't really keep track all all the time of these hidden motivations because <laughs> otherwise it would be really painful and slow for us to act right and, and also on the other end there's this question about the self that is we need to have this sort of uh, lifelong narrative about ourselves to be mentally healthy uh, and i mean right. it's it's not really pos it would not right. really be possible to keep it coherent if we were to be aware of these hidden motives all the time right well there, we could easily imagine creatures who are, are able to be aware of their motives. I mean, that's the creature we imagine ourselves, in fact, to be until you read our book, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's not a crazy kind of creature to have exist. It's just not who you are. And because you are this weird creature you didn't realize you are, you are, in fact, not very capable of that. But it's, it would be quite capable of such creatures to exist who are just honest about their motives and, and did what they thought they were doing. Um, so, so we've been talking about what you shouldn't try to do with the book or what doesn't seem very promising. Um, what to us would seem the most obvious promising thing to do, uh, especially to me, is to continue our work here. Uh, we go over 10 areas, but you could easily imagine another 20 or 30 areas where you could also try to look for hidden motives. Uh, there should be a lot more hidden motives elsewhere in our lives. And we've shown a structure about how to do that it's not complicated per se. It's not high tech, at least. It's just, you know, a matter of detail. In each area, like collect a bunch of possible motives, <laughs> write down a bunch of things that could plausibly be going on, and then collect a bunch of detail about what's actually happening there, especially puzzles with respect to the usual story, and then do the matching. And that's the sort of thing one could should be able to do in a lot of areas. So if you were a policy analyst or a social scientist, who, for whom your focus was understanding the social world, we think that would be tempting to you. <laughs> We've shown you there's this huge like set of things that people are missing where they're just really wrong about things that matter a lot and shown you a, a way to, to find a lot more of them. And if this was your specialty, wouldn't you be excited by that? Wouldn't you be eager to go find more hidden motives? And I have to say, almost no one has this reaction to our book. Mm -hmm. We have we have really not heard from anyone who said, yeah, I'm going to go look for some more hidden motives. 
a lot of people agonize about their own hidden motives. A lot of people go into, well, what could I really think about my motives? Uh, some of them will go into, oh, you can't really be right or you haven't shown it accurately enough. And some people say, yeah, I guess that's how humans are. Isn't that interesting? And almost no one is interested in taking it further. Mm -hmm. That seems to say something interesting to me. Yeah, and uh, another thing at least that I picked up from your book, and please correct me if this is wrong, uh, a conclusion of it all is that we can still act uh, toward our own self-interest, but in more positive ways that is, for example, I think that a good example again is about charity, because we can still be charitable people and be uh, empathic people and obtain all the positive social benefits from showing off pro uh, to other people that we're charitable, but at the same time trying to direct our resources to better ends and to try to help more people than we would be helping other ways. Well, I wouldn't say you won't pay any cost. I might say you could realize the costs are mild and so you might be willing to pay the cost. So, in fact, it looks like ordinary people do think less of effective altruists. They think they are less compassionate <laughs> and they give them less credit for their charity from the point of view of what they care about. But it's not a lot. <laughs> so, you could be willing to pay that price for some other benefits. I mean, you know, you can show off as by being an effective altruism how clever you are, how intellectually consistent you are, how principled you are, how how willing you are to do, you know, conscientious and careful you are. Those are all positive features you can show off by being an effective altruism, even if people will not actually see you as as empathetic. Uh, similarly, say in medicine, right? If usually you would go to the doctor and you'd just be really worried about like whether you're doing it right and whether they're going to find it because, hey, you might die. And you realize, you know, people go to the doctor more or less. It doesn't really make much difference. Well, now you can like not worry about it so much. I mean, yeah, you might die, but agonizing over the doctor isn't going to help much. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and similarly, like for pushing somebody else to go to the doctor, you might feel guilty. You didn't push them to go more. What if they die? But now you might realize, well, they might die, but it won't be your fault. <laughs> they might not think you love them if you don't push them to go to the doctor. And you should worry about whether they know you love them. But if you have some other ways to show them, maybe you shouldn't worry so much about this one way. And so once you realize the agenda, a lot of these things to show off, you might start to just reassess and say, well, who thinks how much of me? Who are the people I want to impress who who don't who aren't as impressed enough yet? And then, what are the things I would th that would really impress them? And you could like think that through and come up with something more focused, rather than just doing all these things that are just designed in the abstract to impress people but aren't very coherent and organized, and may not be well suited to whatever it is you've got that you could show off. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and another aspect I think is that when we learn that we operate uh, on the basis of these hidden motives, uh, on the one hand, <laughs> we could get very cynical about humanity in general. But on the other hand, it's also true that if we, if we are aware of the fact that even if we are highly intellectual people or something like that, we are also victims, let's say, <laughs> of these hidden motivations, and we, we also right. share these flaws with other people, it's also easier for us to turn into more humble people. Right, so, so usually um, we're afraid of looking bad because it, most people presume that most people are good, and if you admit to being bad, you look much, much worse than most people. Yeah. Once you know that most people are in the middle between good and bad, and you're not really any different for them. You're admitting you're bad in a certain way isn't making you showing you worse than most people, uh, even though it might give somebody ammunition to make an accusation about you. And of course, you know, you could be a bit better than most people on some ways, at least, and still not be anywhere near the ideal that you might have thought you were. But not everybody is exactly in the middle. So presumably, some people are more idealistic about some things. 
And you could be one of those people who's more idealistic than some people about other things. So I might say, credibly believe I'm more idealistic about being an intellectual than most intellectuals. And I might have credibly proven that through my research agenda and my topics and what opportunities I've given up and what I've pursued. I might think, well, I've got credible evidence that I am more than most people trying to figure out what's true and figure out and tell people about it, even when it doesn't you know, show off my abilities or say things people want to hear. I might be able to say, well, look, I've con- I am this. But of course, that doesn't mean I'm anything close to the ideal of intellectual that you, I might have had or other people might have had when I was younger. I'm nowhere near that ideal. I just might be closer than other people. <laughs> and so you have to ask yourself, how comforting are you willing to accept that you know, when you look at it carefully. Now, of course, on other parameters, I might be worse than pe- other people. You know, there's a whole bunch of dimensions of life. <laughs> and uh, on some, I'm better and on, more idealistic than others. And on others, I'm worse. Um, that's going to ha- If you're going to be realistic and look at... I mean, most people, when they look at themselves realistically, are going to have to see they're mostly near the middle. And they're going to be better on some parameters and worse on others. And uh, you could look at that and say, well... Am I okay with that? Do I think the parameter I'm better on is more important to me? Mm-hmm. And of course, you, you you can always try to do better. Of course, if you if you if you if you want to, you can always. Whenever you see a difference between your ideals and your actuality, there's two main strategies available to you. One is to try to reaffirm your you know plan to get, to be better, to to re- devote yourself more strongly to your ideals, and that's possible to some degree. And the other is to decide your ideals were not realistic ideals or I- good ideals and, you know, pull back on them. Uh, we often do that with many kinds of ideals. There are many kinds of ideals that kids have about what adults should be like that adults go, that's a crazy ideal. <laughs> that would be stupid. Uh, you know, that that's not at all feasible and that's not at all even desirable. Um, so those are the you know two main categories of responses. Lower your ideals or raise your behavior. Um, but again, not my. I'm not so interested in that. I mean, maybe that's a failing of mine. <laughs> but that's that's again using the book as a self help book. And I'm more of a social scientist here. I'm saying we social scientists and policy analysts have to have a view of the world in order to figure out what policies to recommend or or change. And if our view is just wrong, uh, we're going to be getting that wrong. So it seems to me this this is saying that we have a lot great. Uh, an enormous potential compared to what we have had at doing better once we understand what's really going on. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, maybe, uh, you know, of course, part of it, though, is that people don't actually want reform as much as we thought they did. Mm -hmm. So when you think of people as as idealistic in the way they claim to be, and they claim that they want to help the world and they want a better world, and and they claim that all that it would take to make a better world is for you to be able to show them how to make a better world. And then you think, well, what we social scientists need to do is search in the space of how to make things better and find something and then show it to people and then they'll adopt it and that will make a better world. And if it turns out that social scientists and policy people are not actually trying to make a better world, they're mostly just trying to show off, then it might turn out that you could do the research and figure out how to make the better world and show it to everybody and they still won't care. Uh, they might just not want to do it uh, because it doesn't make them look good. In which case, uh, you might be able to figure out how to make the world better and not get anybody to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And perhaps this next one is a, a sort of an unfair question. I, I'm not sure. But uh, would there be any way, because of all of the things we talked about here today, to try to strike a balance between um, relying on our hidden motives, because as we already talked about here, uh, we don't really want to uh, to exclude all of them, otherwise you, we wouldn't be able to operate normally <laughs> in the world if we were trying to only perform according to conscious motives, let's say. Uh, and so, for example, w- uh, one o- uh, another of the things that you talk about in the book is uh, the cues that we get from other people according to their body language. And I mean, most of them, at least, uh, are true and, and are real, uh, reliable. But on the other end, and talking perhaps about stereotypes, uh, you can also be looking at other people according to uh, some superficial traits like their skin color 
and it wouldn't really lead to good results neither for them nor perhaps for you so i, I mean it perhaps it, this is a very complicated question but is there it's, a, it's pretty simple i think actually the the two thing key things to keep in mind are yeah. whatever your problems are they are many and varied and they don't ha all have one common cause <laughs> and your focus of attention is limited so if you just have lots of different parts that are not very coordinated and your focus of attention is limited self reform has to be of the following form you pick one thing you look at it carefully you ask how could i do this better you start to do that better you get into that habit of better and you're enough into the habit you can look elsewhere and expect to keep going and then look elsewhere and repeat you, you just can't expect to reform all of yourself all at once you are too big and complicated with too many parts that aren't coordinated that's just not going to work if you had like one main failing like i don't love myself enough <laughs> then you could fix that one thing and then it would all go great and you, that's not how you are you, you don't just have one thing that if you fix that one thing everything would all go great you have lots of different parts you have a body language for example or the way you read body language and you could focus on how you react to skin color but you'd have to pick that as your focus you could say let me over the next week watch how i react to skin color and every time i see someone and i see a skin color notice my reaction and then reflect on do i approve of this overall pattern of reaction and if i don't like make a plan for a change and then implement that plan and then watch the plan how is it going how am i doing now in reacting to skin color and continue with the, your new plan until it becomes a habit until you don't have to watch it anymore and then you can switch to something else although you should come back and check periodically to see whether it's slipped back because it might well maybe you were wrong about what it takes for it to stick but still this has to be the general way you would fix things of course this is how we learn anything right you learn to ride a bike you learn to cook steak whatever it is you focus on that one thing <laughs> you ask how am i doing and you read about it or you, you make a plan and then you look at that one thing specifically and then you check how it's doing on that one thing and then after a while you could stop looking at that one thing and you know after you've made three steaks and they've all been good you made them the same way now next time you make a steak you don't have to think about how do i make steaks you just like do it the same way you did the last time and it'll maybe go fine mm -hmm. so in general um this is how reform would have to be personally and elsewhere you, you pick some particular area and do it one at a time so you're uh, what you're saying is that we should strive to try to automatize good behavior is that well is that almost it? all your behavior is automatic i'm afraid you don't have any choice about that you have a limited focus of attention and you can really only do non-automatic things in a very limited area and that's who you are so you have this limited spotlight choose where you put the spotlight where when for how long but you do, cannot see everything all at once you can only see what's in your spotlight mm -hmm. yes but but if we train ourselves step by step to do those things the what they're saying is that uh, with time they become automatic and perhaps we don't even need to think right, conscious, well, consciously about well, them I mean, that's, that's the key point that is you, you put a spotlight on something and you do something while the spotlight's on and the hope is that when the spotlight goes off that continues if that's not true you fail you, <laughs> then you can't permanently change things where the habit won't work now, there are things like that there are things that you can't just you just can't change you can only change temporarily while the spotlight's on and then when the spotlight goes off you go back for those things you can't change them i'm sorry you could you can only change them when the spotlight's there and your spotlight is limited so unless you want it to be there all the time you're going to have to except that you can't really change it you know so there are some things we remember to put the spotlight on you know if i'm ever standing in front of a crowd and giving a speech you know don't scratch my butt <laughs> you might just try to remember that right and you try to set up these cues where it's it's a like uh oh i'm i'm scratching my butt don't do that right <laughs> and so one way to be automatic is just to set these warning flags and, and that's part of what we do automatically we automatically set warning flags 
which are just little habit of noticing a thing in a context such that we could then respond a certain way. That's part of what it means to be automatic. Part of automaticity is automatically turning the spotlight onto certain things in certain ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when, uh, when looking at ways to trying to improve society at large, would you say that we should focus on individual change or collective change? That is, uh, for example, if let's say a person uh, with this new knowledge bit by bit tries to improve his or her own behavior, but then she is inserted into a society where the circumstances don't really uh, allow for that better behavior to express itself in an easy way. So I, I don't know if you... Well, so I mean, yes, yes, I mean, our levers of change are mostly collective in either norms or institutions. Yeah. So um, if you want to get people to change behavior, you need to create a new norm, and a new norm has to be enforceable, mm -hmm. and then people can in implement the new norm. That is, if they see somebody violating the norm, they can point it out and, and you know help them fix it. Mm -hmm. And that's how we collectively change our behaviors through new norms and through new institutions, a new, new voting institution or a new piece of software. That's how we can make changes. Um, Uh, what I've learned, though, is that um, it's actually easier to figure out how to do things better than it is to get people to care. <laughs> I could figure out a new norm that would make the world better. I could figure out a new software app that would make the world well. I could figure out a new political voting rule that would make the world better. With time, I mean, it's not easy, but I've studied this enough and enough other people have studied that we actually know a lot of ways that the world could be better. The hard part is to get anyone to care. How do you get people to want to adopt a new norm or a new piece of software, et cetera, and to bother? That's, that's the hardest part because, again, it's about our motives with respect to reform. So we have talking about hidden motives and real motives and the, and the apparent motives. When we talk about social reform, we talk usually as if we all agree that we have the motive that we want to adopt better reforms. <laughs> That's, of course, what we want to do. That's why we're talking about possible reforms, is because if we found a reform that we liked, we would, of course, work together to adopt it. And that's just not true. People all the time are informed and know about ways to make things better, and they don't do anything. They don't want to do anything. So... Um, Our actual motives with respect to reform are more plausibly, you want to sound like you're a caring, good person. <laughs> you can show, you know, a caring, good person would w care about what reforms could make the world better. So, uh, of course, you know, often we are complaining about the world and we're complaining about behavior in the world. And often we're doing this to show our moral superiority or our high moral standards. Uh, we, and we find that comforting and, and nice. We're, we're fine with complaining about how things are. <laughs> Uh, because that shows that we don't accept how things are, therefore we are disappointed by how things are because we are better than that. Um, and the implication, of course, is that we would want to make things better, and we often, of course, get trapped into saying or presuming that, yes, we're complaining, and therefore we would, of course, try to make things better. And we do often talk about how things could be made better, but we are not at all very practical about that. So, you know, for example, when we elect politicians, I think we mentioned this in the book, um, <laughs> We like politicians who take our positions, positions we can identify with. They are for this and are against that. But we actually don't want politicians much who are good at making change happen. Politicians who are good at working behind the scenes and making deals and working with agencies and working on all the practicalities to make things happen. Because we don't actually want the changes. We just want the position of being in favor of the changes. So, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of like institutional changes people have long known should make things better, but people are not very interested in them, often because they don't have a political polarization projection. That is, they aren't left versus right. So, for example, we have voting rules like approval voting, and people study that say, yeah, approval voting should help, but it's not a left versus right issue, so people just don't care very much. People love to show that they are, if they're on the left, I'm pro this left thing, I'm anti that right thing, if they're on the right, they do the opposite. People love to 
take up the political fight and show they're on their side of the fight and they're loyal to their side of the fight. But as soon as you have a reform that isn't on one side or the other of the usual political fight, people have almost no interest. It just makes everybody better off. But what's so interesting about that? That's not being loyal to your side. That's just helping everybody. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it also has a lot to do with the social, political, economic, and so on. I mean, the environment, the stability of the environment people live in. So, for example, if the environment is too unstable, uh, I mean, the instincts very easily kick in, and so it's <laughs> very difficult to convince people to try to operate under better parameters. I mean, when things are changing a lot, it's hard to figure out what a better institution would be. But for an awful lot of our institutions, things haven't been changing that much. And we have been able to study them and figure out what would be better. But again, people don't care. Like, like I talked before about school and learning the material. <laughs> again, we've known lots of ways to help schools learn the material. Yes, schools are changing somewhat. Yes, you know, there's more computers, less, you know, Latin. But that doesn't really affect much whether we should adopt these ways to learn the material faster. They would learn they would work better for computers just like they would work better for Latin. The fact that we're moving from Latin to computers isn't the reason why we're not adopting all these uh, better ways to learn the material faster. I would say it's because we know at some level we don't want to learn more material. That's not why we're at school. Uh, and similarly, in, these, in many of these other reform areas, the key limitation I would say is that we kind of know that we don't want the thing we're pretending to want. Uh, and so we're not very motivated by a reform that would... So, for example, approval voting would produce better policies. We don't want better policies. We want to show that we're loyal to our side. Yay us, boo them. Approval voting doesn't help with that. So why do we want it? Um, and again, again, over it all, we, we know ways we could organize medicine better to give more effective medicine. We're not interested because we're not using medicine to make us healthier. Uh, we're using it to show we care. And these reforms won't let us show we care more. Yeah, and that's, that's why I posed the question about the individual versus collective approaches, because, I mean, it's still very difficult for people to, uh, when talking about their social domain, their, their social realm, for them to change a lot of their hidden, hidden motives if they go along with what people around them are doing, because it can even turn into a question of survival, right? Um, and, and I think it might be more about coordinating uh, your, with your audiences about your signals, <laughs> about your showing off. So, so for example, uh, say I realize we're spending a lot of medicine and it's not helping very much. And I say, well, let's just cut back on medicine. Well, if I'm a CEO or a family head and I want to just cut back on spending less on medicine, I'm concerned the rest of my family or my employees will think I don't care about them. And so I might say, well, I'm going to show you that I'm going to take this money from medicine and I'm going to spend it on something else you want uh, in order to convince you that I do care about you. I'm just trying to help you more. But uh, even then, uh, even if I get me and my family to agree that medicine isn't very useful and uh, that we're going to spend the money in other ways, we're worried about how it looks to other people elsewhere. What if they hear that, uh, you know, my wife is sick and I just told her to lie in bed and I said, when she, did she go to the doctor? I said, oh, no, doctors aren't any good, so I don't send her there and they think I don't care. And so it's, it's more about this larger equilibrium. Um, you can change your behavior if you're willing to accept the different interpretations people will make of you and your behavior. So you could say, well, I don't learn much in college. The college is expensive. Why don't I just start a business and do something else? And now the problem is later on, somebody will say, what, you don't have a college degree? And they'll think you're an idiot or they won't think you're very capable, right? And so now you have to worry about um, what they'll think of you. And so for a lot of these things, uh, the limitation is in this wider world of perceptions. But sometimes you can decide, well, I don't care about those anymore. So for example, you might be 50 year old, say, and you say, it's kind of late for me to get a college degree. People have already made their opinions about how smart I am, et cetera. And uh, th that just won't help anymore. So, I mean, so some people, even at the age of 50, they think, I'm going to finally show everybody I have a college degree and I know something. Because <laughs> they, they've always felt bad their whole life that uh, the people have been looking down to them and now they're going to prove themselves. Uh, but, you know, again, the more you think about, well, what are you showing to who? Uh, the more you could work through and say, well, I don't really need to show that now. Right, things you might do to convince a potential mate, somebody to marry you once you're married and you're not planning to remarry, 
you might think, mm, don't need to do those anymore. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I mean, um, it's perhaps at least a little bit understandable that when people try to make decisions that would affect them in the long run, uh, I mean, sometimes it can get into they can get into a situation where they have to decide that either they change their uh, that particular aspect of their behavior um, and sacrifice a little bit their social prospects, let's say, or otherwise. Right. Right now, I mean, clearly in the modern world many people make a choice to seem weird to other people in order to gain some specialty advantages, right? Some people say some people become undertakers, right? Now, for most people, dealing with dead bodies is icky. And somebody who was really comfortable with that, well, they're kind of icky too, right? Mm -hmm. But you could overcome that because, well, you're going to be an undertaker and that's going to be your thing. And people might come to respect that for you because, yes, all else equal, somebody who was Want, not bothered by being around dead bodies would be kind of suspicious because you've made this your thing and you've become good at it and you are recognized for it. Well, maybe they will not be concerned about that. They will say, well, I guess you have to be some sort of odd person to be an undertaker, but he's a good undertaker and he's a conscientious one and he's very effective and I'm glad to recommend him. And that you might be okay with that slot in your life, right? So for myself, for example, Obviously, my being willing to talk about the things in our book makes me kind of odd, right? <laughs> Most people who would bring this up at a party, you might like go, they're kind of cynical, they're kind of negative, uh, they're, and, and that it might be just kind of a negative sign about somebody to, to be so cynical about so many things. But if I make it my specialty, I'm saying, I'm not just a generic cynical guy in the bar bitching about things. I wrote a book on it. <laughs> <laughs> and people respect it, and I'm a world expert on this stuff. Uh, this is my thing. And you can see from my personality, I'm not, I'm not low and, and mean and in a low mood and gripey and complainy. I'm a, I'm a bright and optimistic guy and friendly. I'm just, like, talking about these important questions. And, yeah, the conclusions I've drawn are kind of cynical, but that's the way the dice roll, and that's how i got to call it. <laughs> and, you know, you can make that a virtue out of it, right? So be, because we can be different and specialized, you could find yourself a niche in the world where you can, you know, violate some of these typical behaviors and get away with it. Yeah, and I was going to talk about that, the fact that um, isn't it true that <laughs> if we follow along those lines, as you were saying, that we could get into a position that was too niche when when we're talking about perhaps social change i mean personally uh, i i mean uh, perhaps i was thinking more along the lines of um, yes you're trying to improve yourself in this in, in this way in that way uh, and then to perhaps start with you uh, and uh, and try to change people in a larger scale, uh, that means at a societal, collective scale, but uh, perhaps if you get too weird, let's say, <laughs> you, you, get well, into a, in, you get into a niche and then sure. you're stuck with that. Well, you, there's a trade-off in trying to influence a small community or a larger community. Yeah. Uh, well, one strategy is to try to find a small... So as an intellectual, I can say, look, the kind of things I talk about and the way they talk about would put most people off. But I'm just going to find a world of intellectuals and we're going to create a norm within our world that it's okay to talk about these things that way. And then I can enjoy being in that world and talking that way. Uh, of course, if that world disappeared, if I were forced to leave that world, uh, I would pay a cost with respect to a larger world. So anytime you specialize in a particular part of the world, you are at risk for that world disappearing or throwing you out uh, that you'll then have to deal with other people. But, you know, often it might seem that you have a best, good enough chance of stay, staying there, that it's worth that. And of course, if you were trying to change everybody, uh, a first step might be to create a community where that was changed, but then you might ask, well, now how can I move from that to a larger, larger thing? And that maybe the experience of how that worked in the community would give a lot of interesting information and insight into how it might then work on a larger scale, but that, small, that wouldn't be enough. I, I, you'd then have to think about how to move farther. So if we take the Undertaker example, right, 
if if there's an accusation that there's a vampire in the village <laughs> well the undertaker is going to be suspected of being the vampire right because he's just like he fits that scenario uh so he's going to accept he's got to accept that if there's an accusation of some weird guy doing weird things it might be the undertaker because the undertaker is kind of weird especially with respect to death weird things related to death it might be the undertaker and you know and similarly if, if there's you know a concern about somebody somebody who's especially cynical and we economists are thought of being cynical so they're going to look at you and say aha you must be the fault because uh, you're the cynic so you are and so you know that's just a general cost of, of being a specialist in a sense uh, you get the reputation and the associations of specialist and some of those aren't always positive but couldn't it also happen that perhaps the people that get along with you are the ones that share some specific traits with you? For example, they have similar personalities, they sure. share a similar, a similar ideology, and then you create that community that starts to get a little bit insular and of course. Ne ne never really gets to extend beyond their, its boundaries. Sure, although that might be okay with you. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, we, you know, we're always at risk of losing our small community, so we want to retain some robustness and an ability to function in other communities. But yeah. the more likely we are to stay in our community, the more we might mostly invest in that community and not worry about what happens if we had to leave because we don't think we'll have to leave. And that happens all the time, too. So you, you have to make a choice about how general or specialized to be in some ways. Um, and I, you know, I, I think about that myself because I, I want to specialize to being an intellectual, <laughs> but I don't want to specialize to being an intellectual who's an economist or a physicist or a psychologist or, or somebody who represents the West. I want to try to be a universal intellectual, somebody who could see things from the point of view of people a thousand years ago or a thousand years in the future, somebody who could see things from the point of view of, of humanities or sciences. I want to sort of encompass a wide range of intellectual perspectives and not specialize too much. But I want to be an intellectual. I'm fine with that. I've given up on being a musician. I'm not going to specialize as a musician. I'm not going to have the attitudes or styles of a musician. And if if somehow the only job available were me being a musician, I'm just that's not going to go well for me. But I think that's pretty unlikely, so I'm not going to worry about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would you say are perhaps, in, in social terms, um, the risks and advantages of the social world we move in nowadays, in the sense that nowadays it's much more difficult to, to people to live in the same place throughout their lives, they move quite a lot, and so uh, on the one hand, uh, I mean it's very difficult for people that move a lot uh, and that change jobs and places a lot to keep perhaps a sense of community. But on the other end, and uh, thanks yeah. perhaps, uh, and, and the on the other end, thanks perhaps to things like the internet, it's pretty easy nowadays for you to identify to have a certain identity, and when you move to a new place, to very easily find people that live there that mm. share the same interests as you. So I mean, obviously. You know, different kinds of lifestyles require different adaptations and different habits of, of life and behavior. Mm -hmm. I would, I mean, the biggest obvious risk to pay attention to is that we humans might just have certain expectations and habits based on our ancient human environments that no longer apply to the world today. Yeah. So, so for example, uh, it seems to me that in the United States, in high school, uh, people are in the habit of caring an enormous amount about their friends and associates. Yeah. Uh, and that made sense for their ancestors because they would basically be dealing with those people for the rest of their lives. So it made a lot of sense as a kid to start to form the relationships and impressions that would matter for the rest of your life. If people think of you as a nerd in high school, they're going to think of you for the rest of your life. If they think of you as, as unreliable, they might think of you that way for the rest of your life. If you form friendships, you might keep them for the rest of your life. And then people in high school in the United States do seem to put an enormous amount of attention and energy into their reputation and their friendships in high school. But of course, in our world, uh, most people or even many people leave their high school town and never come back. And they'll never deal with those people for the rest of their life. And all that energy is wasted uh, because uh, they'll be 
going to a college, then going off to a city, and then having a whole new set of associates and partners. The, and the things they learn from those relationships will be things they could then transfer to new relationships in their lives, but the specific relationships will just be lost. Mm -hmm. And it seems like their habits don't get that. <laughs> their, their intuitive habit of, of who they, of just paying a lot of attention to their popularity and, and who likes them and who they know doesn't get <laughs> that this is just practice and it'll mostly be thrown away. And so that's, that's one of the many habits. So obviously another thing is just that um, in large cities, we seem to be nice to people and trustworthy in ways that are never going to pay off. <laughs> in, in, in a small town, uh, if you're not nice to people or trustworthy, the word gets back and that hurts you. And in a big city, you could be untrustworthy or rude to somebody who's a stranger on the street and it'll never get back to you probably. Now, in big cities, people are ruder <laughs> and less trustworthy to people they meet on the street. But still, it doesn't seem like their habits of really get how much freedom they have uh, and how far away from, you know, from the small town world they are. And, and so, again, you know, th these are things humans are learning. Uh, and and the key question, of course, is how much, how long these changes will last. So these new environments, if they don't last long enough, then we won't adapt to them. And then we will just, you know, bounce around. We will, our behavior will sit in some, somewhere in the middle of the range of environments we all experience. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, you know, related to the topic of my first book, The Age of M, which we haven't talked about, where I try to imagine this very different future world and try to imagine how behavior would adapt to that world. And it, it is very different. And a lot of things are new and strange. And uh, part of the fun is to really think through how would behavior be different in this world? Because I do think in this world, behavior would, would adapt to it. That is, there's enough incentive and time and selection for behavior to adapt to this new different world, even more so than it has happened in our world. Uh, and so that's the question. How would they behave different in a strange new world? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and uh, wouldn't you say that uh, at least it happened at a global scale with the introduction of uh, capitalism and globalism, uh, that uh, one of the ways, at least uh, at the po in the political realm, uh, people's mentality changed, politicians' mentality changed, was the fact that uh, because they started to, uh, countries started to trade much more uh, among themselves, that it would be much more profitable to them instead of um, starting a war with a neighboring co country, country or something like that to to keep <laughs> to keep people from right. that country alive because then so, they would have the goods from that country and so on and so would you say that perhaps that uh, at the level of big cities could also be happening with individuals when, per, for example, they go to the bakery or a place like that, and even if they don't know the baker, it, it, they have much more to profit from not treating him badly because, I mean, he, he bakes the, well, the, the cake. I mean, if you're going to have repeated interactions with the baker, then it makes more sense uh, right. how you treat them and how they treat you. If you, in a tourist spot, let's say, uh, you know, and you're never going to be there again, then it's much more of a question, like, why tip the waiter at a place you'll never come back to again? Uh, you know, if you, if you come back there regularly, it makes sense to tip the waiter, to, to give them a sense of what you like and don't like, and to make sure they pay attention to you. But, but tipping once in a place you're never coming back to again is more of a puzzle. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested and, and talk a bit in the last book about um, the major changes in attitudes and behaviors of the last few centuries. And uh, certainly some behavior changes are due to adaptation to our new world. That is, uh, because the world has changed, we, our behavior has changed because it makes more sense in this new world. But I think there's a bunch of other behaviors that have changed substantially over the last few centuries that can't really attribute it to that explanation. Uh, and I'm puzzled over that. And uh, I, my story is that uh, we are drifting back toward forager attitudes on many non-work things. Uh, we started out as foragers and we stayed as foragers and then farming became possible, but it was only possible because we used a lot of social pressure and conformity and self-control to make ourselves have new, very different norms and attitudes that were functional in the farming world. And now in the last few centuries, we've been getting rich and the social pressures that turned us into farmers are less compelling when we're rich. 
and we're more asking ourselves what does our forager heart want and it's telling us different things and we're more listening to that because uh, we're less constrained by um, being poor to have to do what works around us and we can just do what we want because we're rich and so I think this explains a lot of major trends over the last few centuries including more democracy less slavery more travel uh, more leisure more promiscuity <laughs> more art uh, you know more product variety I, I think um, a, a lot of the major trends are not because we've adapted to this world except adapting to being rich in the sense of not be going back to forager attitudes because in some sense farmers were always repressed foragers who uh, had enough self-control and discipline to do what they needed to do to survive in their world and to see it as an ideal but we're, we're constantly tempted to become more forager like and having to repress that and sometimes failing and sometimes suffering because of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't you think that perhaps another big reason why those change happened was because uh, capitalism allowed for um, a real enduring uh, economic growth over time that well, that, was that's what caused, in person? Well, that's what caused the wealth that then allowed, the, that caused the attitude change. So that would be, of course, <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, the, the major feature of the last few centuries is we've been able to grow wealth faster than we grow people. So the wealth per person is growth. And then we've had all these attitude changes. And the question is, what's the cause of those attitude changes? And I'd say primarily the cause is wealth. Yeah. Wealth making us feel more inclined to be forager-like, mm -hmm. specifically. And as more forager-like people, at least when we're not at work, because we're actually kind of hyper-farmers at work. But once we leave the work door, we're more hyper, we're more forager-like. And so we have more forager values and attitudes. And that, I think, explains a lot of the major attitude changes over the last few centuries. But that's not because they're more functional. Ours is not a more forager-like world, per se. It's just we like to be more forager-like, personally. Mm -hmm. That's okay. perfect. Yeah? That's yeah, perfect. So that's it <laughs> <laughs> okay okay so okay so dr ensign i guess i don't have any other questions for you today so perhaps we will end it there we're also almost hitting three hours now so all right so uh, just before we finish this would you like perhaps to share with people uh i, I don't know if you're working on a new book or not and uh, share with people where they can find your work on the internet and on social media and things like that. Well, th that last question is the easiest to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, generally I'm hansen.gmu.edu. Uh, that's yeah. where most of my writings and things like that. I have a blog called Overcoming Bias. I'm on Twitter at, at Robin Hansen and also on Facebook. Uh, I have these two recent books uh, which can be found at websites. One is ageofm.com and the other is elephantinthebrain.com. Uh, those are for my two books. The second book is co-authored with uh, Kevin Simler. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, I have other things I'm working on now, though I'm not sure how much I want to say in a short time <laughs> about, I mean, you know, we can go into a longer discussion, but uh, uh, I have this research project I've been working on, uh, a grant from Open Philanthropy, where I've been working on a different future scenario uh, not the one in Age of M, but a related one where there's a different route to artificial intelligence. And uh, I've been trying to explore that scenario um, and have some interesting things to say. Uh, but again, we don't really have time to get into that here. <laughs> and uh, I, I'd, I'd be interested in pursuing the topics in Elephant in the Brain if, if other people are interested in pursuing them. And I guess we will see, like I said, I, I think there's still a great potential here to look at hidden motives in a lot of other areas. Uh, the question is, how interested is the world in that? <laughs> and so I'm very opp opportunistic about my research in the sense that uh, I think there's lots of interesting topics, but I look at things that are neglected and important, uh, where I think you know simple methods can produce a lot of results. And both of my books have been like that. And I will just continue to look for things like that in the future. Uh, but of course, part of the thing is, if I, if I make a contribution to something, will anyone care? <laughs> and that's harder to judge. Uh, again, you, you have these naive assumptions about what people should care about, but then you find out what they do care about, and it's often quite different. And so I'm still, uh, perhaps the, the thing I'm most stuck on or puzzled by is um, if I work on a particular area that I think is important and neglected and I can make progress on, will anyone care? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so perhaps <laughs> in in the future we could have a second interview to talk about 
those other topics that are of interest to you. But I'm happy to, but uh, yeah, I've, I've got a lot more things I could talk about than in one interview, but uh, happy to talk to you again sometime if you like. Okay, great. So, Dr. Ensign, again, I would really like to thank you for taking a bit of your oh. time to being here with us today, thank and it was a real pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for talking to me. Take care. Okay, take care. Hi everybody, thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel last February and have, be, have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge. Any amount, even one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke and Nan Blanchett. Thank you for all.